there's a problem that we need to discuss briefly, so please step into my office and close the door behind you and get a bucket out for puking. It's about to get gross. Disney, a name I'm sure you're all familiar with, it's a place of magic, adventure, and dreams. But what happens when that dream becomes a nightmare? And I'm talking about a sleep paralysis demon that's recently been paying Epcot a visit. And more specifically, Remy's Ratatouille ride at Epcot. Remy's Ratatouille has become less of a ride and more... Hello, Io. Yeah, he, she heard Ratatouille and, you know, sprung into action. She's a huge fan. But yeah, anyway, I don't know what it is about Remy's Ratatouille, but they are summoning the pervert devil. It's like a full-blown exorcism, but instead of dumping out ectoplasm and a haunted spirit, it's actually dumping out cum. There have been two separate instances of park guests going to the Remy's Ratatouille ride and exposing their penis. One of them was actually wanted for other sexual pest degeneracy crimes and was caught on Remy's Ratatouille smoking, watching porn, and masturbating, even finishing a full-blown climax and just dumped his DNA all over the Ratmobile. So he literally turned it into just a fucking cum dumpster. And then the following day, another park guest was getting trespassed outside of the Remy's Ratatouille ride. And during this uh, situation with the park authorities, the guy just dropped trouser, exposing his penis to the public as if he was doing a show and tell on cock. Both of these cases happened only a few weeks ago. So Lord only knows where we could be in another month if this continues, if it becomes some kind of trend. You know, maybe this is the curse of Remy's Ratatouille. Yeah, it's getting scary out there. But yeah, I thought this was so fucking weird, and I hadn't heard anyone talking about it, so I figured it's our duty here to discuss the important things that others are too afraid to tackle, such as <laughs> turning Remy's Ratatouille into your personal masturbatorium and ejaculating on this ride. It's, it's a fucking ride made for children at a Disney park. It doesn't get more degenerate than that. It's unbelievably fucking disgusting. Someone mentioned that earlier. Man caught watching porn and masturbating on a Disney ride. Forgot to look it up though. New Jersey man caught smoking and watching porn on Remy's Ratatouille adventure in Epcot. That'll get you every time. I don't even know why they bothered to include smoking. That's like the least <laughs> startling news here. Robert Fitzpatrick was arrested and charged with a misdemeanor charge of exposing his sex organs. That sounded like straight out of biology class. Was there no one else on the ride? There are warrants for sex or for Fitzpatrick's arrest for sex crimes in California and New Jersey. Further details on those out-of-state charges were not included. Disney cast members were first leery of Fitzpatrick when he wanted to sit alone in a rat or ride cart on March 29th. Generally guests, generally, guests share the cart with other people. It was suspicious that the guest was in the cart alone. Why? Why? Why though? Why? Why would? Why would you ever want to do that? Is it the ride that brought it out of him, or just like that? It's not even like exhibitionist. It's like literally alone masturbating in a weird location. Several cast members monitoring the attraction and surveillance room saw Fitzpatrick smoke and touch himself. Twice they stopped the attraction and made a loudspeaker announcement that smoking was not permitted. They should have just called him out by name like, Ryan, put out the stogie and put your dick back in your pants, please. Just ruin the magic for a moment. Ride continued on and Fitzpatrick began looking at porn on his cell phone and put his hand down his pants. Fitzpatrick then pulled his penis out in the open and continued masturbating inside the ride cart. One cast member said he ejaculated before leaving the ride vehicle. Holy shit. <laughs> so this is what he defiled, huh? That sick bastard. Even the rat looks concerned. On Remy's Ratatouille of all places is nothing sacred. Have some decency. Take that elsewhere. Take that to Dueling Dragons, but not Remy's Ratatouille. Please. The rat is pregnant now. I know. And they're gonna have to retire the vehicle. Or rather they should. At, at that point, 
that it's it's gone through too much already. Don't 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 subject anyone else to the horror. Like yeah, you can clean the cum, but the cum never fully leaves. The memories last forever. Just just get rid of the cart like like a jersey, like a jersey number. Just retire it. Should be noted that although Robert was alone inside the cart, the cart has vents open to the public and is constantly being recorded while the ride is in motion. I I haven't been on Remy's Ratatouille, but is this not a ride that like turns the carts around? Because I remember in a lot of these like I don't know what what do they call them like slow slow movers, Weenie Hut Junior shit. We just like slowly go through something and look at screens. Usually they have like the carts turn and they, like you can see other riders. Is that not the case for Remy's Ratatouille? Because I feel like at that case, there's a lot of families that got a lot more than they bargained for out of this show. It is. It's trackless. So it does turn. <laughs> I can already imagine, like, the parents, like, shielding their eyes. Oh, Jesus Christ! No, he's just... He's he's also got a chef in his pants, and he's, he's cooking over there. Please, God. No, no, no. Don't. Oh, my Lord! The following day, Disney and law enforcement dealt with a second incident at Epcot where another man was arrested for exposing himself. There's an outbreak. There's a plague sweeping through Epcot right now. Good lord. Man, Remy's Ratatouille just really gets the juices flowing. The sheriff's deputy was back at Remy's Ratatouille Adventure on March 30th, where Disney manager reported that Sherwin Shayagon was constantly causing issues inside the park. The arrest report said. He threw items on the ground when authorities escorted him out of Epcot. Who Who is this? Sherwin Sharingan? I don't understand. This is... Is this the guy who exposed himself? Waiting for a taxi to take him back to his hotel and the deputy was writing the trespass paperwork when he pulled down his clothes, exposing his penis to those present. I went from a trespassing charge right to, like, an actual, like, felony. Pulling your cock out at a Disney park. Jesus. Also been charged with exposing his sexual organs, a misdemeanor, according to circuit court records. This feels like a really light charge. Exposing yourself is one thing, but exposing yourself in a children's amusement park is a totally different thing. Aren't those two... Isn't that like a more serious charge? It's not a huge crime because Remy from Ratatouille was pulling his hair, forcing him to do it. <laughs> yeah, imagine he's just been framed. There was also a Disney employee who got fired for filming 500 plus videos under women's skirts yesterday. What is happening at Disney? Jesus Christ. What? Disney employee accused of taking videos of park guests' dresses and skirts for years is fired and arrested. Man, th there is no magic left at Disney. Just terror. Authorities responded to Disney Hollywood Studios March 31st after an employee was witnessed recording an upskirt video of a female guest at the Star Wars retail store, according to an affidavit. Jorge Diaz, 26. <sighs> told authorities in an interview that he had been taking videos of dresses and skirts of unknown females in Disney World theme parks for approximately six years. The man just openly admits it? He's like, ah, so you finally caught me. I'm like the Zodiac killer of upskirts. I've already filmed 500 plus videos. Diaz, who worked at the lightsaber store, told authorities he had what, es what he estimated to be over 500 videos on his phone and showed multiple examples of the videos to detectives. What, this guy, like, seems very proud. Like, happy he got caught. Ah, uh, you guys finally got me. This is great news. Here, come check my camera roll. Look at these. <laughs> he told the detectives he took the videos because it's hard to find them online and they bring him sexual gratification. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Holy shit. Absolute degenerate. Why is his bond only $2,500? He has been released from the Orange County Jail. You best be wearing jeans from now on when you go out around the area. This man's probably got a whole network of cameras set up for those upskirts. They were impressed by his honesty. <laughs> 
man, this guy, this guy is fucking evil, but he's an honest man. God damn it. I really don't know how their charges aren't more severe. Like, to expose yourself in public is already bad, and to do it at a children's theme park is much, much, much worse. Significantly worse. And then the upskirt situation, 500 plus videos, this is a serial sex pest. Like, these aren't, this isn't like some goofy thing, this is like actual crimes. Like, the charges don't sound nearly severe enough for what they have done. So I was super shocked to be reading that. Maybe that's just like preliminary charges and as the case continues to develop, more things will be tacked onto it as they discover more and, you know, go after them harder, hopefully. But yeah, I just wanted to talk about these situations because I hadn't heard anyone discuss it, really, and I thought it was fucking weird. So that's really about it. So yeah. Today I had a rather perplexing question, and I turned to the only person in the world I can really trust. Myself. So I decided to get the answer to the question. Is the new Disney animated film Wish really as bad as everyone's saying it is? For the first time in a long time, this is one of the very few instances I can remember where a Disney film, specifically a Disney animated film, got blasted by both critics and audience alike. And I think a lot of you out there probably didn't even know Disney had a new animated film on the horizon, let alone out right now, because this movie, Wish, received less advertising than my secret TikTok account I made three years ago, It's Shade, where I was doing like awful fucking Doja Cat say-so dances and shit to see if I could organically grow a TikTok account wearing a mask. Spoiler alert, the answer was no. But this movie had no hype around it, legitimately no buzz, and unsurprisingly it's not performing super well in the box office, but where it's really floundering is in the reception to it, where people are saying it's just genuinely not very good. Initially, I didn't have any plans of seeing this film, I just really wasn't interested in it. It didn't seem like a movie I'd really want to go put my ass in a theater for and watch. But after reading the reception to it and what people were saying about it, my curiosity was piqued. And all of you know that I'm drawn to bad movies like a fly to a pile of dog shit. I can't help myself. So, I went to see it last night, and uh, I had to confirm for myself whether or not it really is the super stinker that it's made out to be. And before the intellectuals come in swarms to wiggle their finger and say, Well, actually, Charles, this is a movie designed for children. It's ridiculous to try and critique it as an adult. Bah humbug. Spongebob was designed for kids, but it's enjoyable for all ages. If you're making a quality product, even if its intended demographic is children, it should still be enjoyable to anyone of any age, if it's a good product. Disney used to understand this and be extremely good at it. Something like The Incredibles, I still think is an unbelievable masterpiece of a movie, even at 29 years old, and that movie is designed for a young demographic, but I still appreciate it as an adult because it's just a fucking good movie. I want to I wanna go into Wish a little bit here. I'm going to try and avoid spoilers. I wasn't really interested in seeing it, but after all of the reviews and everything, and somehow it got shredded by most people, which I would have never expected from like a pretty safe Disney animation, I got curious if it's actually bad. So right now it has, I think, the lowest Disney animation opening rating on Rotten Tomatoes ever or something. And I just saw it. And I, it's not bad, but I see why no one really likes it. It's really, really painfully generic. It, it is legitimately just a full-blown marketing campaign that could have been used as like a commercial, but stretched to a feature-length film. I don't understand why they'd even make it. It doesn't really make sense. It, it, they took... Every element of good Disney animations and, like, roped it into this haphazardly. And it has, like, the worst ending in any Disney animated movie I've seen in a minute. It's The ending is terrible. The ending is so, so, so bad. I just don't get why they even bothered with this. They didn't really have a story to tell. Like, the movie's just over an hour, I think. Actually, how long is it? Let me check the runtime. It felt like it had only been like 20 minutes and we had reached the conclusion. Because it's just a speedrun of all the same Disney tropes we've seen a million fucking times. It's an hour 35. It, it literally felt like a 35 minute movie. Which is nice. It didn't drag. 
But even spoiling it, it doesn't really do much. Basically, the concept of the film is fine. Like, the concept is interesting enough. There's a powerful sorcerer, and he takes people's wishes. He's made, like, this utopia kingdom. They give him his wishes to keep... Give the, gives him their wishes for safekeeping, and then he'll occasionally grant them. And the big plot twist... Well, it's not a big plot twist. It's actually established within the first ten minutes of the film. It turns out he's not a great guy. Who could have seen it coming? He takes their wishes because he wants to ensure that they're not going to be a danger to his kingdom. So what he does is he takes all of these wishes and he only grants the safest ones. Like, the most throwaway safe wishes. And Jeremy made a really interesting point that the film itself unintentionally serves as an allegory for modern Disney, where all of these fans have all of these wishes and expectations that they'd love to see Disney act on, and Disney doesn't. Instead, they just grant you the safest, most insignificant garbage content. Like, the safest shit. And I was like, damn, that's actually kind of profound. Like, this movie really is an allegory for how Disney handles what the fans want. Yeah, Jeremy Jans. Jo is, it, is it Johns or Jans? I really like his reviews. I think he does a good job. It's very concise, it's fun. But I never know if it's Jeremy Johns or Jans. Like, there's nothing objectively horrible about the film. It's just so derivative of every other Disney film ever made. You just get nothing out of it. Like, even the musical numbers are pretty uninspired. There's only one that stood out to me as being pretty good, and it's the second song in the film. Like, the second song is the only one that I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of a banger. Everything else, I feel like no one would ever go out of their way to listen to ever again on purpose. They're just so bland. And every side character in this is completely forgettable that serves no purpose. And really, even the main character herself doesn't do anything. She does the most important thing, which is making a wish of her own on a star, which is why you get Luma here. But outside of that, she does nothing. The star does everything until the end of the movie, where it just completely blows its ass wide open. With nonsense. There's been a trend on TikTok to compare it to older Disney movies and their music to show how generic it is. Oh, I believe it, because it, it is painfully generic. A lot of Disney fans on TikTok really don't like the music. Some of them even accuse Disney of using AI to make them. I wouldn't be surprised. Like I said, this, this feels so derivative of everything good from Disney movies of the past tried to, like, make something new out of. Like, it does feel like you would plug all of this into chat GPT and have it spit out a script. It's uninspired... It, the jokes in it, <laughs> like I don't even I don't even know if you could classify them as jokes. They barely even try in that department. There's nothing. It has nothing. But the thing is, like, it's not a bad movie per se. I suppose it's just so uninteresting, so forgettable, and just nothing. I just don't know why they'd even bother with it. No, no, it's it's just boring. Like, it's not fun, bad, or anything. It is just a boring movie. It has nothing to it. There's no meat on its bones. I'll talk about the ending real quick, I guess, because the ending really is like the most egregious, like, hey, let's just wrap this shit up and be done, okay? So basically what happens at the end... <sighs> okay, big spoiler warning if anyone gives a fuck. Huge spoiler warning. Sound the alarms. Wee-woo, wee-woo, wee-woo. Big spoilers. At the very end... It's the final showdown between the main character and the main bad guy. And he's this all-powerful sorcerer. Our main character, she doesn't have any powers of her own. Like I said, she herself doesn't really do anything aside from summon Luma, who does everything. It's, the character's not actually named Luma, it's Star, but it's basically like Rosa and Luma. And he captures Star, and everything looks lost, because it is. He is now all-powerful... All undefeatable, just this fucking monster now. And the way they defeat him is she starts singing a song. So then every citizen of the kingdom joins in in the musical number, and he's already, like, bound them. And they all just start singing, and basically it's the power of their wishes was so great that Star broke free and he got caught in his own staff. Somehow. So they unionized. <laughs> I mean, I guess. Uh, yeah, kinda. But he's just, he's defeated through the power of song, and 
everyone wanting to make wishes. But I don't... Like, there's no reason that should have beat him at all. <laughs> like, it shouldn't... He should have just listened to that and been like, Alright, can you stop wishing? This is fucking cringe. And then he just starts blasting them all again. Like, there's no reason it should have done shit to him. Doesn't the main character become a fairy godmother? Kind of. But until then, she doesn't do anything. And even after that, they don't show her doing anything. You actually watched this? Yeah, I was curious why it was getting shredded so much. I couldn't imagine it actually being that bad. And like I said, objectively, it's not horrible. But it's just a complete waste of time. There's, there's no reason to see this movie. It's just this amalgamation, this fucking chimera of Disney greatness from the past thrown in here really shittily. Disney's just tanking all over. Disney's had a rough year in terms of like the reception to their work. Financially speaking, I don't know how they're faring, but the reception to a lot of the Disney work this year has been rough. Call me AOL because I'm delivering news that I'm sure you already know. Netflix is struggling. I'm sure you've seen the numbers. Year to date, their stock is down over 60%. But more specifically, over the last week, they've really fallen off a cliff. Just got fucking kicked right down that giant well in 300. They went down 37% in a week. So a lot of people are asking the question, is Netflix dying? And that stock graph is looking like a heartbeat monitor about the flat line. It's not looking good. That shit's looking like Blockbuster back in the day. And a lot of people are wondering, well, what could be the cause for this incredible decline so rapidly? And naturally, everyone's turning to me to answer these questions, since I am the preeminent expert on all things shitty movie and TV show related. I have a genuine passion for horrible media, whether that be horrible games, movies, music, shows, whatever. I just love watching and consuming the worst of the worst. Things that turn other people's stomachs, make them puke, cry, and question the existence of God. I get a, a big smile on my face and a wet spot in my trousers. I just really enjoy it. So when people saw this happening to Netflix, they were wondering my opinion on it. Is it because all of the terrible shows and movies Netflix keeps funding? And in my expert opinion, and it pains me to do this, I'm going to have to diagnose Netflix with shitty content disease. But it doesn't mean it's terminal yet. Netflix has been funding basically anything made by someone with a pulse. And even that seems to be spotty. It feels like they're funding scripts written by fucking AI. They have a catalog of actual dog shit shovelware. Like, you remember DOSBox ROMs back in the early internet where it was just actual 30 second games that were just being uploaded to the, the ROM sites that were almost unplayable? That's Netflix right now. They're just this giant cum dumpster of almost unwatchable movies and shows. And it's things nobody is asking for. But they're putting a lot of money into making them for some reason. Like, they'll drop, like, 50 new originals on, like, a single weekend. Be like, hey, new on Netflix. Netflix presents the poop that took a pee. And then they'll be scratching their heads like, oh, why is no one watching that one? We put a lot of money into that production. That's so weird. Why is no one watching this? It just shows that no one would ever even think to watch that Netflix is funding. Now, I want to make it clear, I don't think bad content is solely responsible for the decline of Netflix right now in terms of their stock price and all of that. I definitely think it contributes because as things get more expensive, because things are absolutely getting more expensive in our world, the first thing that people are going to cut is a service like Netflix. You know, Netflix is just a luxury to have, and it's an expensive one. It's $25 a month. So as the cost of living goes up, people are, aren't going to be able to justify subscribing to Netflix anymore when they're not even putting out content that they want to watch in the first place. And especially with so much competition right now, Hulu, HBO Max is kind of killing it. Uh, even Crunchyroll uh, slash Funimation to a certain degree since anime is so big on streaming and Netflix is doing a horrible job with their anime catalog with like JoJo's Part 6, God Rest Its Soul. I know everyone's upset about that. Netflix cannot get anything right. Fucking JoJo's Part 6 has been divided up into like part releases where they released 12 episodes a few months back and they still haven't released the next set of episodes for some inexplicable fucking reason and they have the audacity to hype up, hey, good news, JoJo's Part 6, Part 2 might come out in 2022. Woo yeehaw! Getting sidetracked. But competition, you know, Crunchyroll, Funimation, Disney Plus. Disney Plus kind of slapping them around right now since they took all of like the Marvel shows and everything which people are just gonna idly binge forever on that service. 
So the thing is, Netflix just has a lot to compete with now, and the content they keep funding isn't shit that people want to watch. So their originals don't keep them there, and Netflix has really been bled dry when it comes to shows that people love, to like beloved classics. All of those have gone to other streaming platforms, so Netflix is left with just like the worst of the worst. So I definitely think that does contribute, you know, just not having any of those classic shows anymore for people to just want to watch on Netflix. Those have all gone elsewhere while also not providing any new originals and then still increasing the monthly subscription price is just a recipe for disaster. They've been increasing the price but decreasing the quality of content on the service. It's just really ass backwards right now. I just think they're not really sure what to fund so they just fund everything anyway. Even if it's like a student project by a nine year old or some shit like that and then hope that one of them sticks. So they'll get the occasional banger like Squid Game or Arcane but for every Squid Game and Arcane, there were a thousand Bruise Brothers and other shows that no one has ever heard of. So yeah, the quality of content hasn't been amazing and that's surely contributed to a lot of people deciding like, I can't really justify paying $20 a month for Netflix anymore, I'll just cancel it and stick with one of the other services. I, I, I do think that's a contributing factor. And another thing I want to just say, and I don't know how much of an effect this has, but I really feel like this whole binge model that Netflix is still just living and dying on, which is where they dump an entire season of a show all at once, is just so fucking dumb. I, the binge model was cool in the early days where it's like, wow, I get to watch my favorite show that I remember when I was a kid all at once. I don't have to like wait week by week. Or even like a new show, like wow, all of it's out all at once. But now the novelty I think is completely worn off. I much prefer a weekly release of a show. And on Netflix, Arcane proved it could work. It's so much more fun and engaging to watch a show week by week because then everyone's at the exact same pace. You get to discuss it with friends, family, even online because everyone is at the exact same pace. So you can talk about what might happen next, come up with fan theories and speculate, and it's just a lot more fun to engage with the content that way as opposed to the binge model where they drop all 12 episodes all at once and then you'll have some people call out work the next day in order to finish it all in one night and then you can never really talk about it with anyone because everyone's at different places in the content. Example, Stranger Things Season 3. Third season of Stranger Things was very good, but they dropped all the episodes all at once, so some people finished it in one day, some people in one week. So everyone was at different places in the show and no one ever really talked about it. When Stranger Things dropped, there was a lot of hype and then Within like two, maybe three days, no one was talking about Stranger Things Season 3. It just faded from everyone's memory. Whereas something like Arcane, which was on Netflix, people were talking about the entire run. Every single episode, every drop was trending on Twitter with people talking about it. It just gets people more invested in it. When you're able to discuss it with other people, it just makes it more fun. I just think that whole binge model is really counterintuitive to engagement, as well as keeping people on Netflix. I think it's really fucking stupid. To be honest, like if you're bleeding, you're bleeding out. So you take your best shows and release them all at once. People finish them in one day and then what's their incentive to stay on there? They'll have to wait another six months when you accidentally find another good show to fund. You know, like the, why would they continue to pay for it that long? Whereas when it comes to a weekly release, Netflix does get lucky. They have another huge show like Squid Game and they release it week by week. And then they get some people to stay longer because they're invested in that show. Like it all just makes more sense to just do weekly releases, even just from a business standpoint. But yes, I do agree that the quality of the Netflix content hasn't been great. They've been pumping out a lot of net shits recently, and a lot of people are probably just not bothering to re-up a subscription. But Netflix is cracking down in what I believe to be the wrong area. They're just blaming everyone for password sharing, which is a legitimate problem from a, you know, a business standpoint. Uh, don't get me wrong. A lot of people share passwords. I myself am getting Netflix from Tiana's account. You know, everyone shares the passwords to their Netflix. So there is a lot of unpaying Netflix viewers. So that is a lot of money left on the table for them, but it's such a tricky problem for them to navigate because if you really come down with an iron fist, just flop your meat on the table and like villainize anyone that's ever shared a password, it's going to make it a headache to continue using the platform. So most people just won't even bother. And since there's so many alternatives, they'll just go somewhere else. So them cracking down on password sharing is going to be a really tight rope to walk. I know they've tossed around the idea of doing like a really cheap Netflix, Netflix subscription that has ads with it. For people that don't want to pay the full $20 but still want to watch the content, they could do a cheap alternative but getting some ads there. 
Maybe that's a decent solution. I don't really know. It's not like an unheard of one. I know other services offer that. I just don't know how successful they are in that area. But again, cracking down on password sharing, like throw these people in the slammer. They shared their password with too many people. I want them fucking arrested. And like making it really like a cutthroat policy is only going to serve to damage Netflix further. So they'll have to really come up with like a consumer friendly option to get people who are sharing passwords to instead pay a little bit to continue watching the content. And I don't know how the fuck they're going to pull off that balancing act. But I do think perhaps the best solution for hemorrhaging so many subscribers is just by offering better content. This is quite literally like that Twitter meme of make better content or I'm unsubscribing. That is actually happen happening to Netflix right now. The price of everything in the world is getting more expensive. Netflix is expensive. And most people aren't going to want to spend $20 a month for shit where they might get one good show twice a year. That's just not worth the cost. So the best thing they can do is just improve with what they're putting on the platform. And another thing that not a lot of people have mentioned is Netflix's numbers were heavily inflated because of COVID. When COVID hit, everyone went to subscribing to streaming platforms because everyone was locked at home watching shows and movies and shit like that. Now that everyone's getting back into like a normal routine in the real world, all those people are starting to cancel these subscriptions. So the numbers just got like really inflated. So maybe this is just equalizing and it's totally normal. Can't really say for sure. But what I can say for sure is Netflix has so much garbage on it that no one really wants to watch while only ever providing a couple of good shows a quarter. So th that I think is a, a big problem for them and the competition's getting fierce. So I just wanted to talk about this a little bit because... It's an interesting topic, I think. I always find it very fascinating when there's a company that's too big to fail, starting to fail. I don't think Netflix is in any danger of closing its doors anytime soon. They still have like 220 million active subscribers. So they are still very much in the game. It's just a matter of them having a bit of a stumble here. And by a bit of a stumble, I mean they're fucking spiraling down a dirty toilet. 65% year-to-date loss in the stock is kind of rough. But they're still fine overall. I don't think they're in any danger of dying anytime soon. So I just wanted to talk about it. That's about it. See ya. All right, let's just get this out of the way. Rip the band-aid off so you can all point and laugh at me, spit at me, call me names, and give me wedgies. I'm not Percy Jackson. I didn't get the role. Disney Plus finally released their trailer for the upcoming Percy Jackson series. And just like Batman's parents, I'm not there. Uh, they made the inexplicably disgusting decision to not cast me as the lead role even though I put forth probably one of the best auditions Hollywood had ever been graced with. I'm not going to pretend to understand why they chose to cast an actual child to play Percy Jackson. I understand that Percy Jackson in the books is like 12 years old but it's called acting. Yes I may be a 28 year old man but thanks to the miracle of technology we can de-age me a bit. I can shave, trim up my hair, I already have the height of a child. I should have been able to fit the bill. And I, you know, no disrespect to the actor playing Percy Jackson. All power to them. I think they've done a, a fantastic job. And I have no, no doubt the show is going to be a smashing success. But you can't help but wonder, what if they did cast me? We could have been looking at the next Citizen's Kane. And, and that's all I'm saying. It's just a bit of missed potential here. And yes, I'm clearly a bit disappointed. This is the second time I've been snubbed. The first time being when my performance in The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 didn't net me an Oscar nomination. I'm just really getting the sneaking suspicion Hollywood's not ready for my level of talent. And that's okay. They'll catch up at some point as our species continues to evolve. But the, the, the thing that I want to talk about here isn't the fact that I didn't get the role. I actually knew I didn't as early as last year. I made a follow-up video to my audition letting you all know that I didn't get the role. But what did surprise me today and what I feel is outright wrong and borderline illegal is the fact that Disney used my public audition tape, which I proudly posted for the world to see what true acting looks like. And I thought it'd be kind of like a victory lap and a teachable moment for all up-and-coming aspiring actors to, you know, use me as a role model for acting prowess. I posted this on YouTube. I submitted it to Disney uh, through the official channels as well. So they clearly got it. And they clearly watched it because they used my exact lines in my audition for their official trailer. And, you know, that that's a load of dirty barnacles, I'll tell you what. I spent a long time choosing my monologue for that audition tape. And Disney just takes it and, and, and you know, wipes their ass with it. And, I, and I, I've had about enough. I've had it up here. Honestly, with all this tomfoolery in Hollywood, especially with Disney. Not only did they refuse me the role that I was meant to play, 
they also turned around and released cum hats. Actual Disney Bukaki helmet merch. You know, where does the madness stop, Disney? Have you no shame at all? And really, it's not just Disney. I'm tired of, you know, the, the Hollywood elite not taking me seriously. They're just like, oh, let's fuck Charlie in the ass again. You know, his butthole's loose enough to take it. Ha hardy har har. You know, and I'm out here giving my all in these roles for these for these auditions. And I'm not getting any callbacks. But anyway, let me let me show you my audition compared to the official trailer because it's jarring. The Percy Jackson trailer came out. I know, man, it's so painful. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm not in it. <clears throat> it's so painful. It should have been me. Look, I didn't want to be a half blood. Oh, I even I even read this line. It's dangerous. No fucking way. It's scary. Most of the time, it gets you killed. I read the. They stole this from my audition tapes. What? I did that line so much better. I should have been the star. The other day. Where do I start? I think it's right, right here. I didn't want to be a half blood. If you suspect you might be a half blood, then this book. Okay, is they cut this part. Just go ahead and close it and believe whatever lies your mom and dad told you about your birth. It's easier that way. Where does it pick up? Being a half blood there is it dangerous. Is. It's scary. Sometimes it gets you killed. Gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. That is so much better than that kid. Why didn't I get the role? Literal chills. Maybe it's because I didn't shower before the audition. I'm super greasy here. If you think you might be one of us, my advice is turn away while you still can. Believe whatever lie your mom or dad told you about your birth. They stole this from my audition. They plagiarized my audition and didn't even cast me. Yes, I understand it's supposed to be played by a 12 year old. That's the beauty of acting. I shave, I trim my hair a bit perhaps, and bang, I'm 12 years old. M and maybe a little de-aging AI tech. That was, I, that was my line. If you suspect you might be a half-blood, then this book isn't for you. Just go ahead and close it and believe whatever- Listen to that emotion. Dad told you about your birth. Listen to this range. That way. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time it gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. Oh my god, the emphasis there is nuts. Oh, unlucky. Disney just wasn't ready. Okay. Uh, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. They stole my line reading from my audition tape. And I guarantee this kid's not going to be as good as action at action as I am. Watch me fight this Hydra. Blast! It's great Poseidon's beard. It's the Hydra. Yeah. Yeah. I do my own stunts. Yeah. 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 See, like this is outrageous. This kid's not going to be able to do that. That was my role. I was born to play that role. Now that I've presented the irrefutable evidence, I believe we can all come to the conclusion that Disney owes me an apology. And I'll settle for nothing less than a minor role in a major blockbuster production. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a little fucked up they do this. I chose that line from a list of Percy Jackson's most famous quotes, and I called dibs. And you can't, you can't break the bro code like that. I've never read Percy Jackson. I never even watched the Percy Jackson movies. I actually don't know shit about the character at all. It just happened to be an open casting call that sounded like fun. And I killed it. I crushed that audition. I don't care what anyone says. I, I became Percy Jackson for a brief moment during that audition. Charlie left this realm. And the spirit of Percy Jackson came into this vessel. And delivered some of the most powerful, hard-hitting lines and sword-fighting choreography video cameras have ever captured. And it's, it's shocking they didn't choose me. So yeah, if that doesn't prove that Disney's corrupt, then truly nothing will. So yeah, anyway, I wanted to address this since a lot of people have been bringing it up. You know, Charlie, did you know that you're not Percy Jackson? Yes, I'm well aware. So yeah, I mean, that's about it. See ya. The history of Disney's worst attraction ever, Superstar Limo. I don't know that one. Oh, because this was California. Yeah, I never rode this. The big cheese. I'm not the big. I wish I was the big cheese. This is the big cheese. Oh! 
Yo, my God. Mickey. Well, I want to give you a personal tour of Disney's California Adventure. Ooh, what do you say we start with a ride on California Screamin'? Uh. So, Mickey? Yeah, this looks like so, shit. You, and, you know, Mickey, I think this is the beginning <laughs> Sounds of good, monkey. Theme park. You betcha. It wasn't. And now the story of a company in panic and the one CEO who just couldn't seem to catch a break. So was Michael Eisner like the worst CEO of Disney ever? Plan. Like this guy seems to fucking suck. He can't get anything right. Two years later in 1984, it was easy, clear that despite Epcot's the success, eight track. Disney as a company was not doing well. A string of box office failures from their studio and big budget projects for the parks had brought Disney to the lowest point in the company's history. The fuck is and splash. many feared to take over. In a bold move by the company, <gasps> oh, then CEO and President Ron Mill then by the company. Hold on. Is this the, uh... Yeah, hey, wait, I know Splash. When I was a kid, there's a scene in Splash where the mermaid has her titties out. And you can see side boob. I used to pause that scene occasionally. It wasn't my go-to movie, but I used to watch that occasionally to look at titties when I was a young man. Let me type, I'll just type it in. Splash titty scene, maybe? Splash titty? Nope, that, oh, wow. I don't know what I was thinking with that. Uh, I don't know if I can find the scene, but yeah, it's a classic. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Apart from the Disneyland Hotel, the Rather Corporation also owned the RMS Queen Mary, a retired ocean liner that was permanently docked in Long Beach, California. After Disney acquired the Rather Corporation, Eisner became interested in transforming the Queen Mary and surrounding land into a new resort called Port Disney. Port wow, Disney was to feature very hotels, ambitious. a cruise ship dock, and an all-new ocean-themed amusement park called Disney Sea. Eisner pitted the cities of Anaheim and Long Beach against one another, trying to decide whether to build Disney Sea as Holy the second shit. Disneyland resort or build it in Long Beach within Port Disney. Imagine if he actually made, made that. In 1990, and Anaheim and Long what Beach the both fuck? That looks nuts. To theme park to their city. However, the citizens of both cities were not... This man was straight city. building Atlantis. Deciding the issues of the residential neighborhood. Eisner had a simple technique that he often used when he decided on new projects. What the will lose us the most money jealousy. quickest? Whenever Eisner saw another Classic company Eisner. doing something successfully, he decided that Disney would do the same thing. Moreover, he would take the idea and do basically the same thing in basically the same place. For instance, after seeing the success of the amusement park zoo hybrid Bush Gardens Tampa in the early 90s, he greenlit Disney's Animal Kingdom. The park was just over an hour from Busch Gardens. After seeing the success of the Church Street Station nightclubs in Orlando, Florida, Eisner greenlit his own nightclubs and So this guy was just plagiarized Pleasure Island was and still couldn't do it right. Station. So when Westcott was canceled and Disney returned to the Fucking drawing Eisner. Board, it wouldn't be long until... Since the Disneyland Resort at the time provided... This whole career was just copying course, homework many badly. Many of the guests would go explore the other... T this concept would develop into the plans for California Adventure, a California-themed theme park to be located in the already California-themed California. Concept art for the park was released in... Who cares about California that much? Canceled. If you the want to experience California, California just go outside in California. Soaring above you. In the Hollywood section of the park, there was to be a who needs a fucking tribute to California? The what the and fuck? Former restaurant at the Los Angeles International Airport, which was being renovated by Walt Disney Imagineering around the time that California Adventure was in development. This was to be the show building to one of California Adventure's. Oh my God! This word is losing meaning. I've heard it so many fucking times. A high-speed dark ride. That I have proposed the California, California section, California in California Adventures, California. Colon. It would be greeted by Michael Eisner. For instance, guests would fly past the famous Tale of the Pup Hot. Thanks, Valentine. We actually watched all of Chains of Love sounds of flatulence but as guests turned the corner it would become clear that this was actually elvis presley squirting mustard onto a hot dog the ride ended with guests hmm. reaching the chinese theater only to have eisner tell them that he would have to cancel the contract because they had been caught by the paparazzi then a picture taken of guests while on the ride would be shown cropped into a tabloid reporting on their limo chase after this guests would exit like the red carpet into the chinese theater which was the gift shop and exit to the attraction where fake oscars on-ride photos and t-shirts would have been sold the original concept of superstar limo was nothing groundbreaking but it seemed that it would have been a fun dark ride that would have fit perfectly in the hollywood section of the park However, the mid-90s version of the attraction would not be the one the guests experienced when the park opened. And this time, it wasn't Eisner's fault. I can't even believe that. Eisner paid him to say that. In August of this was Eisner's fault. Paris, France, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a limo accident. Her driver oh, was supposedly fleeing from paparazzi when he lost control of the wheel. 
the tragedy captured the attention of the entire world, who grieved the death of the princess and the other passengers. As for Eisner and his team, they now had a big problem. Superstar Limo could no longer be a high-speed paparazzi chase. Yeah. It would now seem that it was some <laughs> yeah. sort of twisted reference to the tragedy. The Imagineer scrambled. Eisner got fucked on that one. Cloning a Unfortunately, if their job was to please the boss, they had done it a little too well. Eisner, who had been in the entertainment industry for decades, adored the inside jokes and Hollywood gags. Jesus Christ, so Eisner. He let the new, terrible version of the attraction. Imagineering, most likely baffled at what they now had to do, did their best to make the attraction work. This art style hey, was also puppy used lover. the ride itself. The only three-dimensional animated figures would be that of celebrities. But due to the lack of oh, budget, hey! it have to be that, celebrities who was that, Jared Fogel? Who the fuck just popped out the there? Disney Company already had contracts with. Also, these were not animatronics, but barely animated figures with minimal, unconvincing movement. At some point, uh, who's that? Realized that That's the Regis? Was going to be bad. The retooled ride opened with California Adventure on February 8th, 2001. So was it as bad as they thought it would be? Yes. Yes, it was. I want to see it. Let's fucking ride it, baby. Get me on there with a GoPro. Let's go. The inside jokes to California and the entertainment industry would begin with a female announcer giving instructions to arriving passengers. Try not to fall asleep on the ride. That's the only rule. No oh, hey, that was the only rule. Guess Fuck yeah. Good guess. Screens a genius. Entertainment news report. After guests winded their way through the queue, they would approach the ground transportation section of the airport and board their limo. A sparkly, purple, cartoonish limo. Hey, it looks pretty cool if you ask me. Cars ...and tells them to enjoy their premiere. As a solid whip. ...sent on their way into their... This is fucking drifting room. around corners. An announcer tells them to keep their hands, feet, and egos in the limo at all times. Ha. The limo enters a dark time. They don't be mean to the ride. What the fuck? It's not their fault. They didn't want to do it. The next show scene is the sunset pretty cool. strip. Here, guests get to see Tim Allen and Jackie Chan. <gasps> Tim Allen! This, second tunnel and Jackie Chan, yeah! Guests are shown an on-ride photo of themselves before entering the final tunnel, <laughs> where their agent tells them that they are a superstar. And I that was Zell Superstar Limo. And who can... I don't know why he called it the worst attraction ever. That shit looked now, fucking now, awesome. Here we, here we go. Now, this is not a scary fast ride, right? No, no, no. This is just uh, like a you don't get it. You can't just experience it with a video. You have to be in there and feel the hydraulics and the adrenaline of, like, being in the car as it slowly drives through. It's not the same, but just a video. This is a real easy ride to go on. Yeah? Okay. JCC in sync. Woo! Let's fucking get it. Hold your breath now. Whoa! Look at how much fun Drew's having. Wow, this is one hell of a ride. Hollywood favorite, Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah, we're having fun. There might be no better wow. way to illustrate the reaction the public had to the ride than the on-ride photos. It is no surprise that the ride was received negatively, with guests complaining Can't that they waited why. a half hour to ride the cheap pop-up book. Superstar Limo was not the only issue. California Adventure as a whole was berated by the general public and critics alike. But overall, the lines were so short at times out here. I thought it was closed. The new management team constructed the Pixar-themed dark ride, Monsters, Inc., Mike and Sully to the rescue. The simple dark ride would take guests throughout the events of the first Monsters, Inc. film. And it was set to open on January 23rd. Looks like shit. Boo, where's Tim Allen? Oh, wait, Tim Allen actually does voice in this, doesn't he? Oh, no. The ride very much lives on. It, it, Tim Allen is in Monsters, Inc., isn't he? Since the Monsters, Inc. dark ride was a quick fix. No? Okay. All right. Boo, fuck this. No Tim Allen. And there was one more thing. Oh, yeah. They stripped Can't click the Sonic, but celebrity wouldn't watch that tonight anyway. To various animatronics throughout the ride. Some of these zombatronics are more obvious than others, and the Drew Carey and Jackie Chan figures are especially easy to spot. But don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Most, if not every, the story is a good reminder that even a company as big as Disney can still oh, get themselves true, into Dan. financial difficulty, creative gridlock, and even some pretty wacky situations. That is On pretty the next, wacky. Defunct land. Okay, one more defunct land. The failure of Disney's Chuck E. Cheese ripoff club Disney. I'm thinking the Chuck E. Cheese one as well. During all of this, Eisner himself would cash in stock options of Ooh. nearly six hundred million dollars. Holy Money shit! Was flying all over the place at the Walt Disney Company. What but none the of was going fuck? To the company's other major division. Disney parks had gone on a roller coaster of its own. No wonder he didn't fucking care years. about making and Disney any good. Disney decade was good not God. Going as planned. Defunct Land is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Was that in Killer Bean? In the 1990s, the Wild West of the Did Jeff Luna voice that one? Apart from the recent themed restaurant chains were sprouting up all over the country. 
with the usual suspects being Rainforest Cafe, the Hard Rock Cafe, and Planet Hollywood. Oh, Planet the Hollywood was so good. New developments might have been the, the rise and indoor was children's play places. These were a mix of tubes, slides, ball pits, nets, stairs with steps stupid kids having body, fun on a socks, boring course, socks with holes in them. Damn, marketing was so different back then. Holy shit. I don't think so. Then where? This is like some TikTok shit. DZ is made just for me. A place where I can really cut loose. What the fuck is DZ? D's nuts or something? Like, what the fuck is this? I've never heard of DZ. Discovery Zone. its first location in Canada. Opening 39 more locations until being purchased in 1992 by wealthy Chicago businessman Donald Flynn. In less than Donald three years, Flynn, the big man. In 40 locations, McDonald's had noticed the competition, and in 1991 had created their own chain of indoor amusement centers. I don't know centers, about that. Num -nums. And bounds. Too nostalgic. McDonald's would not be able to keep up with Discovery Zone, and would sell all 48 leaps and bounds locations to the company in 1994. Around this time, Blockbuster Video, who owned about 20% oh, yeah. of Discovery Zone, went up its stake to 50.1% and would like assume Goliath. control of the company in 1995. And 13 fun centers, along with the Discovery Zone name and logo, were purchased by the company's main competitor, a powerful rat oh, named Charles shit. Entertainment Cheese. That son of a bitch. Wow. That is horrifying. What the fuck? I cannot believe this place was successful. This is like actual horror movie shit. Like that rat is fucking methed out. Many locations so would be quickly bought by rival chain Showbiz Pizza Place, Ooh. which was started by a Chuck E. Cheese franchisee in 1980. Showbiz Pizza did not rebrand any of the Chuck E. Cheese restaurants, and the two chains would eventually be merged in 1990, with Showbiz Pizza Time Incorporated choosing to go all in on the Chuck E. Cheese brand, abandoning Showbiz Pizza's animatronic band, the Rock of Fire Explosion, in the process. Throughout all of the Damn, Showbiz is going in on the technology there. there. Those animatronics look smooth. In 1992. It was around this time that the Walt Disney Company took note of the success of these companies. While they might have been late to the game, they expected to fit right in. After all, Discovery Zone had been described as an indoor Disney world, and Chuck E. Cheese's used Disney as a major inspiration during its development. Sure one zone. If Disney utilized the same concept, implementing their attention to detail and intellectual properties, they could dominate the new market. And dominate they did. One day, Michael Eisner himself walked in looking to purchase some items for Disney. The fact that the CEO of one of the world's largest corporations was concerned with something as small as furniture was a true testament to Eisner's micromanagement. Levitt and Eisner apparently hit it off, and he was quickly named Director of Corporate Projects and Executive what? Assistant to Eisner. During his first tenure with Disney, Wait. he would also become an executive in charge of- Just because he fucking Walt gave Disney him an over-the-pants hand job at a furniture store? Locations, what? Including the Disney Village Marketplace and its Pleasure Island nightclub district. Levitt came up with the idea for an ESPN-themed restaurant to be placed on Pleasure Island. In 1993, How do you even convince the board of directors to accept that? A company that I was shopping for furniture and you gotta meet this guy, patients. Art Levitt. I mean, he's, so, he's such later, a nice guy. He, he gave me like a fucking Disney, fist bump and shit. Yeah, I'm gonna put him in charge of our whole company. Entertainment, an area for children under three called the Pooh and You Corner, a storybook <laughs> time, and a variety of arcade cool, games. Cool name. At some locations, there was a Little Mermaid themed All right, I'm just gonna go play in the Pooh and You. Quote, some locations had a magician performing tricks as Merlin, oh. and the cake for the parties was catered by the what? Cheesecake Factory. A child That's actually nuts. Club Disney with an adult, and both were given a Cheesecake Factory bangs. I mean, that's so like child could leave with If you don't know what you want to eat, you go to the Cheesecake Factory and you get a whole fucking dictionary full of pages and pages of shit to eat. Within the complex, so many different food no items, all 20,000 calories. Daycare center. The head of attendance calculating at the Walt Disney Company estimated that over 10,000 visitors would show up on opening day. And surprise, he was a little off. When Club Disney opened its doors on February 21st, 1997, only 1,000 visitors showed. Oh, shit! No one had learned anything from Euro Disneyland's opening. One sheriff was quoted saying, We were expecting a lot more people. Maybe because Disney advertised that tens of thousands were going to be here, it That's scared rough. people away. While reviews were positive, Club Disney was not without its critics. One of the higher-end malls that Club Disney had moved into accused Disney of ignoring the complex's theming standards by implementing their cheesy design. Also, parents complained about the price of admission, especially the necessity for a separate adult ticket. 
as they were not participating in the club's activities and were required to be there. True. Club Disney pretty also scummy. that Disney was best off not teaching anything ever. The company was cutting costs across the board, and Club Disney became another casualty of the financial issues. The chain was closed on November 1st, 1999, having never expanded past its original five locations. Jesus Christ. This was around the same That's time rough. that Discovery Zone ceased its operations. Leading many to believe that indoor play zones were access. just a fad of the Appreciate 90s, it. as Chuck E. Cheese's would prove. There is some longevity to the concept, so long as you innovate or evolve. As for Disney Regional Entertainment, Chuck E. Cheese hasn't Disney fucking evolved. What are you talking about? Three projects. Another Why is it still fucking weird? Would create was ESPN the Zone. Were part bar, what a cool part place to be. Part arcade, part gift shop, and part broadcast studio. It was such a hit among sports fans that there were apparently points where guests would have to be dragged out for staying in excess of amount of time. The ESPN Zone would also put on the ultimate couch potato competition, a sitting competition that challenged participants to watch TV without falling asleep or getting up, only allowing a bathroom break every eight hours. One year, the winner what? watched TV for three straight days. What the fuck? Wait, what? ESPN no Zone way someone didn't die from deep vein thrombosis. No way. And grow to a total of nine locations. A little over a year ago, Disney overdosed on Skooma, and their delusion really went off the rails when they finally launched their Star Wars Hotel experience. This was a prime receptacle for spitballs and tomatoes. Booze heard around the world because it was laughably overpriced and extremely confusing on what you were even paying for in the first place. It was initially announced like way back in 2017, and it was supposed to carry a price tag of $6,000 for a two-night stay, but it could go as low as $4,000 as well. It's called the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser, and it's supposed to be a fully immersive Star Wars experience for super fans to spend two nights in this like underground bunker hotel facility that's supposed to be like a murder mystery song and dance with all kinds of Star Wars characters as well as a hotel as well as fine dining. It basically just takes a ton of different things through it at a dartboard and said okay it's going in the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser we're gonna charge a fucking outrageous price. At four or six thousand dollars for two nights I would expect to have a room on a legitimate fucking spaceship. With that amount of money, those rooms better be coming with that titty alien that Mark Hamill milks in the movie. Like, that is a crazy price tag. $1,200 per person per night? My god. You'd need to be like fucking Scrooge McDuck to be able to afford that. Or the biggest Star Wars fan in the world who's willing to just dump everything into a two-night experience. But what's crazy is... It looks miserable to stay in. Here's the rooms. Here's one of the 100 cabin rooms. It's basically like a little prison. Like, your children get these small pods in the wall. The bed looks rather small. Like, this is not what you would expect for this amount of money. You go to the goddamn Star Wars gulag. It's, it's so startling. There's no windows. Like, keep in mind, there's no windows in these rooms. All you get is these little screens supposed to look like you're out in space but it looks really dated. It doesn't seem like they put a whole lot of effort into that, but I haven't been, so maybe it's cooler in person. But there's no windows, so you're basically going in there into like a goddamn stasis chamber there two days away from the world. And when you're not forsaken to your solitary confinement room on the Star Wars Galactic Looney Bin, you get interactive theater out the wazoo. Which to me sounds like one of the circles of hell somewhere, where you can't escape theater and people in character for Star Wars 24-7. That just seems way, way too much. So the pictures I'm getting are from a video from DFB Guides who went over the entire Star Wars hotel experience. And overall, it's just an expensive, confusing, jumbled mess from everything I've seen. And this opened only a little over a year ago, and it's already closing. This was a complete disaster for Disney, I imagine. Of course, I'm not their fucking accountant, I can't flip through their, their books here and double check, but I just can't imagine at that price point, as well as how awful their marketing had been for it, that it was financially successful for them. They're writing it off as like a business decision that they've decided to close it so shortly after launch, but that doesn't make any sense, that just sounds like a bad business decision if it was doing well. It's a hundred cabins, a clearly a very expensive endeavor, and they're already giving up after a year. When this shit launched, it had terrible publicity. Like, they made these marketing pitches that gave people no insight into what they were paying for. 
So people already started kind of wiping their ass with the whole idea of even staying there or considering it. It turned everyone off immediately and it's never recovered. Now it's worth mentioning, among the people that have paid a visit to this facility, the majority of them are saying that they enjoyed it and that it was worth the cost. I don't know if that's genuine or if it's some level of brainwashing where they paid so much money that they convinced themselves that they had to enjoy it, thus they did. But people did seem to like it when they paid all that money for it. And that makes sense because if you're a super fan of Star Wars, there's nothing you're going to dislike about it. You're just perpetually inundated with constant stimulation of Star Wars shit. So I imagine most fans probably would have loved it. I still don't know how you could really like the rooms though. Even in all the videos I've seen and all the people that visit the rooms, they are super small for how much you're paying. You are not getting like a luxury cabin. It's very much like a, like a summer camp, like band camp fucking cabin here. I'm still a bit baffled by the decision to have the guests stay in these tight windowless quarters. Like, that sounds miserable. I, why, why that? Like, what's the next Star Wars hotel gonna be? Pay $10,000 and we'll freeze you in carbonite like Han Solo? Like, it's, this is not a comfortable... Uh, you know, stay. Which I think is just ridiculous for how much you're paying to be there. And where you sleep in a hotel, I would argue, is the most important thing about a hotel. Though I guess in this case it's supposed to be more than that. It's supposed to be like a Star Wars experience where you fucking transcend the human race for a brief moment and take a journey into fantasy. But then when you come out from reality, you leave this underground nuclear fallout shelter of the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser, you realize you're $6,000 down and about to miss a house payment or something. I still can't get over just how expensive this fucking place is. Or was. The final voyage is coming up in September, so it's, it's on its way out, but still. One other thing I want to mention is when these announcement videos were first coming out, these pictures were first surfacing of the experience, one thing that I heavily criticized was the food. It hypes itself up as being like fine dining, you know, pinky out establishment kind of thing. And the food they were showcasing looked like slop. Actual prison slop that they would serve on a tray at like a maximum security ward. It didn't look like high quality food for that price. It'd have names like the Yakpi Shrimp Blue Milk Glorb Stuffer, and what you would see on the plate is like two tiddly winks of pork and a small piece of bread or something. But after going through and watching more of the videos over the last like four or five months, the food does look fine. So I don't know why they chose the most unflattering promotional pieces for their food in the beginning, but it does seem like the food is a big hit with the people that go there. And from what I see, it looks fine. Albeit it has the cardinal sin that every high dining facility has where you get portion sizes that wouldn't be enough to fill the belly of a bumblebee. So that that's always, uh, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> a bit of a scam to charge so much and receive so little, but... That's just the trend in very expensive restaurants, unfortunately. I always think portion sizes are important, so if you're paying a lot of money, you should be able to fill your full belly. You, you should walk out of there feeling full, satisfied, and your gluttony, you know, satiated. But anyway, the food does look fine, and that was something that I was very vocal about in the beginning, being lackluster. Some of you may remember I toyed around with the idea of getting the, the gang together and spending the two nights at that hotel. But we really sidelined that idea, f fucking flushed that down the toilet because that is way too expensive. So I don't think we're ever going to do that. That's not worth the amount of money for the sake of like basically a joke or just to experience something awful. Like none of us are huge Star Wars fans. Like I like Star Wars. I couldn't stand the new trilogy, but overall I love the Star Wars universe, especially everything with the Old Republic. This has nothing to do with that, so this wouldn't even be in this wouldn't even be in my favorite era of Star Wars. And none of my friends are big Star Wars fanatics either, so it's not like we'd get anything out of this other than like not having fun and trying to make a joke out of it, which is not worth fucking six thousand dollars. So I don't think that's happening. I want to go ahead and clear that up. We're not going even before it closes. It's not worth it. Now at the funeral for the Star Wars Hotel, Disney is trying to put on a strong face, saying that this premium boutique experience gave us the opportunity to try new things on a smaller scale of 100 rooms, and as we prepare for its final voyage, we'll take what we've learned to create future experiences that can reach more of our guests and fans. I'm not on the Disney Superstar Board of Directors or anything, but I'll offer you some free consultation here. Lower the price. No one is paying $1,200 per person per night. That's a crazy ask. You could have saved yourself a huge headache if you just made this more accessible financially for 
most people. I think that's the way that you reach new guests and more fans, right? Like that's, it seems like a pretty simple solution to the mathematical equation here. So I think it was just way too expensive. I have no doubt there's a lot of people that probably would have loved to go there and couldn't have, couldn't afford to. So they completely missed out on that entire market. Now, they, like I said, they are trying to treat it like a learning experience, and I have no doubt they fucking learned a lot from this. They invested a ton into the project, a lot of time and a lot of money, and they're kind of eating shit on it, it seems. So, yeah, that's really about it. See ya. Everybody loves Spider-Man. He's probably one of the most well-known superheroes of all time. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but he's dead. He died. Like, he's buried six feet underground right now, and he's probably in hell because he was a sinner. He had sex before marriage, and now he's burning an eternal damnation. And it wasn't any of the normal suspects that would have been the one to finally do him in. He wasn't killed by Doc Ock, Green Goblin, or even Rhino. It was Disney themselves. You see, at one of their theme parks, they have an animatronic Spider-Man that does an acrobatic aerial show as part of an in-park show. And half the time, he just dies. Like, the robot just collides with a building and fucking blows up like, like half the time spider-man never makes it to the other side oh wait yeah i've seen that at disneyland outside spider-man they have a robot spider-man that swings across the top of the building and 50 percent of the time it actually hits the side of the building that's misleading because that's uh, that was just a viral video that someone edited you're talking about this right back to the drawing board an animatronic spider-man is supposed to swing high into the air do a backflip and land safely on a hidden net as part of a stunt show at the avengers campus however earlier this week well the fact that it's on the news the makes me feel like it's real Okay, that looks like it hurts. No, we that, want to make sure I saw a video of how this was edited. It's just a robot. It's not a real person. Nobody running later in the same. I guess place. not. What? Attraction. Does occasionally malfunction. You're right. Oh, uh, I guess I guess it's real. Oh, okay. Down there. I thought it was CGI. Stuff. Like, oh, this is a real human being. I thought that was a robot for a second. Okay. Oh no, it is. It's this. Field testing, here I come. All right. Whee! Woo! Okay, it's time to see what this suit can do. I hope it can do this. It's like when a video game cutscene malfunctions. That's an amazing I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, because it didn't work. It just from the start it didn't work. That is hype. Wait, so how the fuck did it even malfunction like this? So how the fuck? Wait, how does this work then? I'm so confused. It seems like it's gonna not work every fucking time. <laughs> Even when it works, it looks like it malfunctions. No, no, obviously it's not a real person, but yeah, it just hits like a fucking rag doll. Interesting. That, yeah, that's, I like that a lot. The malfunction's even more confusing because he... <laughs> because even when it's correctly working, he's doing like somersaults and, and flips and shit, whereas when it breaks, it's like a, it's like stiff, like, well, like rigor mortis. Like, I, I, I don't get it. Like, no flips or anything. <laughs> Okay, that looks like it hurts, but we want to make sure that- like It just straight up seizes. The intern turned it off. Yeah, it's like they actually threw a dead body through it. 
Like, it doesn't do anything close to like what it's supposed to. That's what I saw. That's fake. This was fake. So that one's not real. I know that. <laughs> I've seen it like eight times now. That shit's so good. That one's real. I mean, that one was on the news and they had to shut it down. So that one's legitimate. I want to build <laughs> and threw it in the coffin. Yeah. In oh my goodness! I, where did that come from? Ten, nine, oh, fuck. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, Get ready, Spider-Man. <laughs> Even when it works, it's still so fucking goofy. It's like something out of iRobot. That's cool though. I think that's really cool. Front row Disneyland Disney World Parade Fire. <laughs> Is it supposed to like shoot fire? No, it doesn't seem like that's supposed to like be fire at all. Oh boy. Oh. <laughs> it's just raining ash in him. <laughs> no! We're gonna need the Disney Imagineers out here ASAP. Whatever you do, don't get out of the costume. Oh fuck, it is melting. How long does this go on for? Artemis Fowl is without exaggeration the worst Disney movie I've ever seen. And that's not a statement I make lightly. There are Disney movies I think sucked fat asshole. But Artemis Fowl is a whole new beast. This thing stands atop the mountain of asshole that's been sucked and is at an unreachable level. This is the raid boss of sucked ass. It is truly terrible in every department imaginable. Nothing in this movie makes sense. Nothing flows together. The movie's like 40 minutes long. It's like a fucking speed run of a movie. And by the time the movie ends, you wonder what even happened. Was there a story? Did anything even fucking occur? And if it did, why? It's just a confusing, convoluted mess of dog shit. It is an entire diaper of dog shit. It's truly horrendous, and I can't even believe that it even got put out. I, this should have just been scrapped. They should have flushed this down the toilet. Something Chris Stuckman mentioned in his review of this film is the teaser trailer for it was almost non-existent in the movie. All the scenes that were shot for the teaser trailer didn't exist in the final cut of the movie that's out right now. There's only like three scenes from the trailer that's actually in the movie. Everything else was cut at some point or just never existed in the first place. So I don't know what the fuck happened there. Maybe the movie that got published on Disney Plus is like a rough intern cut for it that they made as a joke and accidentally uploaded. I have no idea. But it is an absolute abomination. A repulsive, putrid, petri dish of puke. I can't express enough how bored I was watching it, and then how incredibly confused I was around the mid-game here. So, right away the movie shows you that it's not good, and it knows it's not good. The character, the main character, the lead, Artemis Fowl, the acting is truly terrible, and I don't like saying that because it is a child actor, and I don't even think it's his fault, but there was no direction. It feels like everything that was used was the first take for him. Every single line from Artemis Fowl sounds like it's just being read right off of a script. There's no emotion behind it, there's no like facial expressions, there's no acting, it's just a stoic, neutral face with every single line. It's like in a video game when the animations aren't loading. It just, it just feels so weird. It's like if I was reading the lines. It just sounds like a script reading, it looks like a script reading. It's just weird. It, I don't know why that would be the takes they'd use, because I'm sure the kid can act. He wouldn't be in a Disney movie if he's not an actor and can't actually act. So I don't know why they'd use only these uh, emotionless moments for like emotionally heavy scenes. I don't think anyone's gonna mind, but I'll get into slight spoilers. There's a character that dies that you're supposed to care about, but none of the characters in this movie have any reason for you to care about them. They're not fleshed out. They have like no relationships with each other that make any sense 
For example, one of the main characters becomes a friend of Artemis Fowl after she's been trapped in a cage by him, and then he lets her out of the cage after a while, and she's like, yeah, we can be friends now. Even though she was three seconds ago, the scene before, hating him, absolutely fucking hating him, but now they're friends. What I'm saying is there's no reason to care about the characters, but one of the characters is dying, and Artemis Fowl, well, he doesn't care. Or at least that's how it seems, because as the character's dying, the guy's crying, Artemis Fowl, I mean, there's nothing coming from him. He's just sitting there watching him die. He's like, man, this sucks. Bro, you're dying, dude. This shit, man, that's tough. You know what? I'll sing, I'll sing you a poem. And then he sings him a poem, all unenthusiastic and monotone. And then all of a sudden, the character's not dead because there's a, there's a, you know, a way to not kill the character that makes no sense. Which I'm gonna get into now because this entire fucking movie makes no sense narratively. It's a true mess of nothing. Absolutely fucking nothing. There's a main villain that kidnaps Artemis Fowl's dad. And they, they're only going to get his dad back if they find the Acleus, Oculus, whatever the fuck. I already forgot what it was called. It's called the Oculus, but they say it like Acleus or some shit. Uh, so then Artemis Fowl has to find the Acleus. Uh, and then, you know, eventually he finds the Acleus and he gets his dad back and the villain just goes, No! And that's the end of that. You have only have three scenes with the main villain. The, the, the main villain is in three scenes. That I can remember. Maybe four. Maybe four. I can't. Honestly, the whole thing just is like this fucking fever dream. It actually feels like a dream. You know, you can remember bits and pieces of what went on, but you don't know why it all made sense at the time. Even though it never made sense at the time in this movie. Nothing in this movie fucking works. Things just happen. Let me give another example here. Well, first of all, there's only two locations in this movie. There's the mansion, and then there's the fairy universe. So they saved a lot of money on locations, because the whole movie just takes place at either of those two locations, nowhere else. So they really saved a pretty penny on that, I imagine. That and the CGI, because the CGI is absolutely terrible. It looks like we just went back in time 20 years. This feels like a movie that would have came out like in the late 90s, maybe, as like a straight-to-VHS production. But as, that aside, the example I want to give... There's a fight on Artemis Fowl's mansion because he's got the, the important thing. And now uh, the time freeze zone is collapsing. And the time freeze, zone is time freeze zone collapsing is a really big deal. While the time freeze zone is collapsing, the general of the fairies is getting overthrown by an evil fairy. And while the general is getting overthrown by the evil fairy, the general is getting in trouble because the evil fairy is taking over because he's working with the villain. And time zone's collapsing. Yeah, the villain, the overthrowing guy throws a troll into the, the house to attack Artemis Fowl, beat the troll, time zone collapse. Now the time zone collapsing is apparently like a doomsday apocalypse scenario. Things go wild, everyone's panicking like, holy shit, this is our last chance to survive. The boy's not going to make it, Artemis Fowl is dead because the time freeze is, is done. And then in the next scene, after hyping it up and showing how bad it can be, Artemis Fowl and everything's fine. The mansion's fine. Nothing happened. What happens is the time freeze collapses. Artemis Fowl says, we need to find cover. So they run off screen. The next scene, they come out of cover. They're like, damn, that was close. And then right after that, the guy who just overthrew the general fairy says, you know what? You can take charge again. I'm a good guy now. With nothing, nothing connecting it at all. He just sent the fucking troll in there. Troll got beaten and now he's a good guy again and they accept him as a good guy. It makes no sense. The movie is a fucking disaster. I mean, like, maybe there's things I missed, because admittedly, I, I was dozing off occasionally for, like, split seconds. I, I didn't want to miss a single fucking moment of this movie, but unfortunately, it is so unbelievably boring and uninteresting that, yes, I was dozing off a little bit. But that only speaks volumes to just how truly terrible, terrible it is, because I never sleep through bad movies. I don't even think about it, because I am glued to an abominable, abominable piece of media. I love it. But this is on another level I didn't even think possible, especially not for Disney. It is crazily shit. It's truly terrible. Plugging this into the moist meter, Artemis Fowl is getting a wonderful 10%. And let me explain. It should be 5, but I'm going to explain why it's 10%. There is an element of this movie in being so bad that it does occasionally cross into the realm of being enjoyably bad. That is the only, say, the only thing that is saving it from a 5% on the moist meter because there is some entertainment to laugh at. And that's the only positive. That's the only positive. And uh, that's really about it. It is awful. That's it. See ya. Disney adult. If that didn't just jump scare you and send a shiver down your spine, then you've either never heard of a Disney adult, never met one, or you're not human. Because you should be afraid. Very afraid. 
Now, of course, not all Disney adults are built the same. There's different levels of it. I'm talking about the most extreme level of completely obsessed to the point where it becomes their entire life and identity. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with being a fan of Disney products. As an adult, I like a lot of Disney things. But there's a big difference between greaseball, goofball, goblin man Charles and a Disney adult that's willing to uproot their entire life just to be closer to the theme parks in order to go every single day. You may think that this is some kind of crazy exaggeration that doesn't happen, but it does. More often than you think. There are a large number of, of seemingly totally normal people that for some reason have been completely brainwashed and perpetually spend a large chunk of their paycheck consuming Disney products or just going to Disney properties way more often than any reasonable person should. It's, it's so weird. And Disney knows this. Which is why they've now recently announced that they're building their own community, their own neighborhood, basically, for Disney adults to go live together and be part of the Disney family forever. Even just the marketing material give me the heebie-jeebies saying that this is going to be the best chapter of your life, <laughs> like, forever. I don't know, that's eerie sounding. Visiting a Disney neighborhood sounds worse than visiting hell. At least the demons and devils in hell aren't pretending to be something they're not. Because Disney is an evil corporation. I don't care how you spin it, no matter how big of a fan you are of Disney properties. Disney as a corporation is one of the greediest, shadiest, and just downright deplorable companies there is in the world. For a company that's supposed to be all about magic and being the happiest place on earth, the only time Disney seems to be at its happiest is when they're magically face-fucking you with their insatiable gluttony to shake you down for all of your lunch money and keep you perpetually suckling on their teat, consuming only their milk. It, it, is, it is a scary company. I'm not here to really get into the weeds of all of the awful things Disney has done since its inception, but I do want to get into the weeds of the neighborhood here, because I find this to just be like a dystopian idea, where corporations like Disney are going to start building their own communities. In my opinion, it's just an alarming idea. But anyway, the first one from Disney here is being pitched as story living. And there's no information on pricing that I can find at the moment, but since it's Disney, you can bet your sweet bippy it's going to be overpriced. You'll be paying seven figures for a one bed, one bath, 400 square foot crack shack without a driveway. Because in the Disney neighborhood, you use magic to get around or some shit. Like, you're gonna, overpay. you're gonna overpay for your property in the Disney neighborhood, I imagine. But one thing that really stands out to me is, in the pitch here, they have this legendary service notice where it says, At Cotino Community, which is the first part of Story Living, cast members will strive to deliver the same friendly Disney service you've come to expect. This was super odd to me. What do you mean cast members? It's a neighborhood, right? I've lived in neighborhood communities my entire life, and I've never seen NPCs wandering around checking in on me, making sure I'm abiding by rules and regulations, asking me questions. This sounds more like spies. And the whole idea of this neighborhood is actually bigger than I thought it was. It's not just a residential community. This is basically a place that they're building for people to go to die. In addition to having housing from Disney, the community is seemingly isolated from the rest of the world, just locked into this one fucking dimension over here, like where Squidward went to be all alone, but this time it's only for the most obsessed Disney fans. So you would have property in the community, and the community itself also has stores and restaurants and, like, activities and uh, events all held within that neighborhood, as well as, like a, like, a beach that you have to pay for access to as well, even as a community member. So it really feels like this is where people would go and then not leave. That's the design of it, because why would they? Everything they need is there, and it's all Disney approved, and you love Disney, so why not just go spend your entire life here and make sure you empty out your piggy bank the entire way before you shed the mortal coil? They have like a proposed 55 and older only community as well. So to me, it really just seems like they're trying to build the one-stop shop for Disney adults to go to die. Like, spend the rest of their life, spend all of their money on Disney and Disney only, so that way it doesn't go elsewhere, so that way they can have it all. And it's just so weird. I think it's such a fucking weird idea. So, I went over it a little more on stream last night, I'll show you a couple clips of that before hopping back in for a bit more analysis. Have you heard about the city Disney is building called Story Living? Talking about the, the Disney neighborhood? That's gotta be the worst place on earth. This place would be absolutely miserable to live. Imagine being in a Disney-only community. 
have their own police force, the HOA would go crazy. Smiles mandatory, if not, you get executed in the town square. I wonder if you're allowed to have Netflix there. Oh, no chance. That'd be a crime punishable by death in Disney story living or whatever. The housing's too expensive, no one's gonna buy these. You don't know Disney adults. Disney adults will actually trample each other just for the chance of living in a Disney neighborhood. Touch the hearts and minds of people around the world for nearly 100 years. Okay, and stop sucking your own dick. Just show me the neighborhood. By our world -class Disney Casper. As Imagineers, story is at the heart of I still think it's so cute they call themselves Imagineers. Places to life to immerse you in the... This exciting new venture will enhance, extend, and strengthen the Disney brand by allowing us to bring the magic of Disney to places <laughs> you may never have expected. Surveillance. <laughs> we enhance the Disney brand by spying on you. We own you. You live in our neighborhoods and you are literally our property. Community is something truly special. We're exploring Nightmarish a is the word I'd use. US for our story living by Disney here in the community of Rancho Mirage. Just is this like WandaVision? Springs, kind of. And I'm excited to announce that our first story living by Disney community will be located in experienced home builders at each site who contribute their talents and expertise to each community. But yeah, that's the gist of it. It's not really like celebration. This is legitimately a Disney neighborhood. And I imagine those houses are going to come pre-built with some kind of surveillance or data harvesting program. Charles, I noticed at approximately 8.45 p.m. this evening you weren't smiling. Is something is something the matter? Do we need to have you re-educated? Be happy or else. It's not even so much about be happy. It's more... I consume forever. Consume or else. Do we need to send the Imagine police to have a talk with you? Oh, the, the police won't be imaginary. Those aren't Imagineers in uniform, I'll tell you what. Disney's absolutely gonna have like, an, like a paramilitary force. They are gonna lock this shit down. You can get in, but not out. No, 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 you can get out too the second you can't afford to live there anymore. Or if you make the mistake of trying to download a competing streaming service. Contraband of the Disney neighborhoods is gonna be like smuggling in a DVD of like Boss Baby or something. An animation that's not Disney. Disney wants to own human souls themselves. At least the Disney adults will all be in one place so we can avoid them. I mean, yeah, it'd be kind of like a quarantine zone for like the most brainwashed Disney adults, I suppose. And actually, I do wonder if they'd even be allowed access to the rest of the internet. I really imagine this Disney neighborhood being complete lock and key. Like, your days are designed for you. Your restricted access to a bunch of different things. Yeah, it'd probably just be like an intranet for the neighborhood. Because, I mean, if they give you unrestricted access to the internet, you could be leaving a negative review about the housing situation. You could be saying less than favorable things and they can't have that. You should go there when built. Man, fuck that. That'd be going to like a Scientology church. That's scary. Let's go ahead and play around a little bit here, because I don't exactly know how this neighborhood's going to go, but knowing Disney, I think this could end up being, like, one of the most outrageously strict places on the planet. I really feel there's a non-zero chance that they will outright forbid anything that's not Disney or Disney adjacent. Like, they won't have direct competition. I wouldn't be surprised if you can't even Amazon Prime packages into your Disney neighborhood house. Like, they probably would just turn them away at the door or something. You can only order through Disney pre-approved services. I really think that that's not out of the realm of possibility, because it seems like they're going to really own this neighborhood. Everything is going to be Disney-related. Like I said, the cast members thing really throws me for a wild loop, because that just seems like actual simulation cult shit to a certain degree, where you will be monitored. Like, it seems like it's going to be constant surveillance from the cast members on their community. I also do think there's a non-zero chance that there will be some expectations on their residents as part of, like, an HOA agreement where they'll attend Disney events or Disney-hosted celebrations within the community and shit like that in order to get them active in the community or something, and they'll probably spin it as, like, you gotta really embrace the magic. You're living in the Disney neighborhood, damn it, so come to all of our events. Why are you here if you don't want to be? You know, get over here, come to the events in order to try and 
get them on the hook to start spending more money on Disney-related shit and continue the brainwashing. If you're already living in the Disney neighborhood, if you paid to be there, you're already pretty brainwashed, but this is like another level. This is a completely different level where you are just completely submerged in Disney and Disney only, cut off from the rest of the world. Also worth noting real quick, Disney has tried something similar before with a place called Celebration, which is, like, it's pretty similar to what they're pitching here with Story Living by Disney, but it completely failed. Celebration completely failed. It was a disaster for them, and I think they no longer have Celebration as, like, a Disney thing anymore. I'm not entirely sure. It's all kind of messy, but it... It was a failure on Disney's part to do this in the past, but they're trying again. They're saying, you know what? What about Second Breakfast? That was so good, I want to try it a second time. And they're going with Story Living this time. But they broaden the scope, and they want to create all of these amenities for the neighborhood. And to me, it all just seems like control. <laughs> like, they just want to control all of your spending and make sure it all goes back into Disney's pockets. This shit is scary. Also, I read something from Celebration back when it was still Disney's, where apparently the HOA was so fucking evil that they had some kind of clause where they could legally tell you that you have to get rid of your pets if they're deemed a nuisance or something. I only read a little bit about that from Google, so take that with a grain of salt. That could be all anecdotal and completely incorrect. But I wouldn't be surprised if Disney really did have something like that. And I wouldn't be surprised they have something like that and Story Living by Disney when they do build this. I really do think it'll probably be one of the most awful places to live, truly. Even as, like, a Disney adult, if you're a huge fan of Disney, I think living there would make you fucking hate Disney, too. But, yeah, anyway, I just wanted to talk about this a little bit. That's it. See ya. I've said for years now, one of the most evil companies on the planet is Disney. I imagine the board of directors is a who's who of supervillains. You probably got Mickey Mouse right next to Lucifer in that seat. It is always shocking to see just how low they'll stoop for the sake of a couple extra doubloons. They're like a real world umbrella corp, but instead of manufacturing the T-virus that turns people into zombies, they manufacture the D-virus that turns people into Disney defenders, where they'll always fight their PR battles for them and constantly empty their piggy bank for anything Disney slaps its fucking logo on. It's sickening, even when they are completely in the wrong. I've been following a story for the last couple days, and I imagine some of you have as well. It's a very sad story about a woman who had an allergic reaction and died after eating at a Disney Springs restaurant. And the holly jolly old assholes at Disney are arguing that because the husband signed up for a Disney Plus trial in 2019, he agreed to terms that would basically turn this lawsuit into toilet paper. To any sensible human being on the planet with a functioning frontal lobe, you're probably asking yourself, how does a Disney Plus trial at all have any grounds for this lawsuit when the allergic reaction happened at one of Disney's parks. It's not like his wife had an allergic reaction to the dog shit Disney Plus is feeding them. She passed away because of a complete failure from the restaurant. It is entirely their fault. So the couple chose to eat at a restaurant called Raglan Road Irish Pub, and they told the waiter that she had severe allergies to dairy and nuts, and she was unequivocally assured the food would be allergen free and they chose this restaurant because it is apparently very accommodating to people with allergies so when the order arrived there was no allergen free flags so they inquired again if it was allergen free and were once again assured that they were safe for her to consume 45 minutes later she had an allergic reaction even after administering an EpiPen, she had difficulty breathing collapsed and later passed away and the husband is rightfully trying to sue Disney for this because it is a colossal fuck up here. And Disney's just dancing on her grave. They're just spitting on her memory by trying to toss out the wrongful death lawsuit by trying to say that the husband signed up for a Disney Plus account in 2019 which has language that prevents them from being sued in this manner. It'd have to be through arbitration, meaning it's overseen by a neutral third party and not a judge. And also... He had apparently agreed to similar terms when purchasing a park ticket online in September 2023. So this opened up a massive can of worms here about all of the sneaky, scummy shit companies sneak into their terms when you sign up for services or if you purchase things online. You know that shit that every human being on the planet skips through with agreeing to terms and conditions? Yeah, it turns out sometimes 
There's some really awful shit in there. I wanted to wait before talking about this because I've been talking to a lawyer about it because I was very curious if there is any legs at all for Disney to stand on here. But I just couldn't wait because I've already seen a couple of conversations about why it's entirely this couple's fault for gambling with their food allergies. The state of the world is so fucking saddening. How is it a gamble? So she was allergic to dairy and nuts, and this was made abundantly clear to the staff of a restaurant that is well known for being accommodating to allergies. Apparently this restaurant has a commitment to being very conscious of allergens. So they chose this restaurant for that reason and made it very clear multiple times that dairy and nuts were a problem. And they were assured multiple times that the food they had ordered was not going to pose any problems for that allergy. They did everything they could. That's not gambling, you absolute cro magnon that are arguing that it's actually their fault, Disney's blameless. This is what I'm talking about with the D-Virus. People falling over themselves to try and take bullets for Disney. It is a fuck up from the restaurant, and by extension, Disney. I know they have more money than God, but even still, this is such an outrageous claim to be making because signing up for a Disney Plus trial should have no effect on what happens at a Disney park. That's not related at all. It shouldn't extend to that. Just imagine if that was normal. Let's say you're on a Boeing flight and all the screws on the flight all of a sudden just spontaneously pop off like a, a water balloon exploding and all of a sudden your plane just disassembles itself in the air and you, you die, everyone dies on board because the Boeing flight malfunctions, as Boeing flights are known to do these days. Well, what if Boeing said, well, that's a real shame about that, but, you know, we can't be held liable for this because every single one of them when purchasing their tickets online agreed that no matter what happens, it's gonna have to go to arbitration, so sorry about that, but really condolences. I am super confident that wouldn't work. You can't just have this blanket statement of, eh, whatever happens, not our fault, and you agreed to it, see, you said right here, doesn't matter, you're, you're fucked. Like, that just, that can't work. And from what I've heard from a couple of lawyers that have talked about it online, as well as a couple conversations I've had, this doesn't really protect Disney, but this has become so common in contracts as a way of trying to weasel big corporations out of liability. But it's still scary because it does give them some leverage to fight on. It gives them an angle, and with the amount of money they can pour into defending themselves, it's gonna make it very hard for normal people to fight back, even when Disney is 100% responsible for the tragedy that occurred. But at least Disney's very apologetic here. We're deeply saddened by the family's loss and understand their grief. Given that this restaurant is neither owned nor operated by Disney, we are merely defending ourselves against the plaintiff's attorney's attempt to include us in their lawsuit against the restaurant. They're fundamentally going, oh, we don't know those guys. They just use our land. We're, we're, we're kind of just like a landlord. We, do, we are not associated with those scoundrels over there at all. No, 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 not us. Nope. Uh, you're coming after the wrong guy, bub. Uh, go after them. Not our fault. And if you do want to go after us, you can't really because uh, your Disney Plus free trial from 2019. Did you forget about that? Eek. Sorry. Now, the lawyer representing the family called it absurd and preposterous, saying that the case is based on the incredible argument that any person who signs up for an account, even free trials that are not extended beyond the trial period, will have forever waived the right to a jury trial, which is pure insanity. And they also argue that Mr. Piccolo, the husband, agreed to the terms of use for himself but he's now acting on behalf of his late wife who never agreed to the terms, which I think is a really strong point. I think the lawyer is right here. His wife never signed up for the Disney Plus trial, thus she shouldn't be subjected to the fucking shackle and chains that apparently every Disney Plus subscriber is now succumbed to. Uh, the lawyer then goes on to say, the notion that terms agreed to by a consumer when creating a Disney Plus free trial account would forever bar that consumer's right to a jury trial in any dispute with any Disney affiliate or subsidiary is so outrageously unreasonable and unfair as to shock the judicial conscience. It really is exceptionally evil, and from what I've read here, it's not exclusive to Disney. So apparently there was even a time where they were going to get close to protecting consumers from this kind of shit with like these arbitration clauses that get snuck into contracts that you sign up for unknowingly because it is unreasonable to expect anyone to read all 65 pages of every terms and condition for every service you sign up for. There's no human being on the planet that has the chutzpah to sit through and read all of that. 
But apparently that ruling that was going to protect consumers got fucked in Congress. So it, it's just corporations really do operate on a different level than everything and everyone else. So no matter how much they are pushed to stop this shady shit, they can always pay their way out of it so it never actually sees the light of day and they can continue to do the scummiest things. Uh, another quote here is, Most of the companies in the U.S. require mandatory arbitration and allows them to, by and large, cut off much relief. Companies love it, but individuals who are harmed by these corporations really don't have any access to any form that would give them relief, as that's a real problem. It just limits consumers' options. It protects companies by fucking consumers in the face. The Supreme Court's view is, if you don't like it, don't sign it. Which is a super easy position to have for all the troglodytes in Supreme Court, because they're so ancient and archaic that these geriatric fossils don't sign up for anything or any service because they don't even know what a goddamn computer is. They're still learning about that mystical, magical thing called the cyberspace and the internet. So they don't even know what the fuck this is. All they need to know is what the corporations tell them they need to know. But every normal person in the world all has different services that they have to sign up for. I'm not talking about just like entertainment services. Like no one needs to have like a Netflix account or anything or a, a Epic Games account or something. But even just like I remember 10 years ago when I was in my apartment... There was an online sign-up I had to do that had pages upon pages upon pages of terms and conditions. And I didn't read through all of them. I feel like most people don't read through all of them. Banking online, all types of services that are literally required for most normal people all have tons and tons of terms and conditions. And they are probably sneaking in some truly heinous shit. And this story right here helps shine a light on some of it and how unreasonable it is. And the Supreme Court saying, if you don't like it, don't sign up for it, is just, that's not realistic. It's just not at all. But yeah, anyway, this shit is super horrible. Disney super sucks. That's about it. See ya. I just woke up. That's why my hair makes me look like a crazy person. Or more like Radagast the Brown, kind of. But even though I may look like a lunatic, I assure you I am of sound mind and body. Which is more than I can say for the guy we're about to take a look at today. The Disneyland Streaker. It happened a few days ago, so I'm a little tardy to the party with the video here, but I did talk about it on stream as it was unfolding. But now that all the smoke is settled and his dick is back in his pants, most likely in a prison cell, I figured let's talk about it as well as all the information that's come out, as well as the other videos that have been surfacing from it. For those that don't know, a few days ago, there was a 26-year-old man who got completely nude and streaked around Disneyland, uh, specifically the It's a Small World attraction. Now this is only act one of his performance, he begins with his boxers on at least, but shortly after this he does go whole hog out. Now this is the It's a Small World attraction, they are trying to inform writers, you know, like don't panic, <laughs> we've got an unidentified object entering into the fray here, this isn't part of your regu regularly scheduled Disney program, and he is, he is out of it, he, there, his soul has left the shell. I think it's pretty clear he's under the influence of something, and I don't think it's alcohol. Most people are pointing to this being some kind of PCP event, which I think it very well could be. Of course, I'm not an expert, but all that's pretty clear is he was really feeling some type of way in the It's a Small World ride. Oh my god. Break all the stuff. I don't think so. It seems like he's looking for something. Maybe looking for Walt Disney's cryo sleep tube. I have no idea. He's gonna maybe try and bring him back from the dead. I I, I couldn't tell you. But he's on a, he's on an adventure here. He's kind of rampaging through. It's a small world. He's pushing around the animatronics. So people are saying like, oh, he's gonna break everything. Which, you know. 
to his credit, he didn't. I, you know, I half expected to watch this video and see him, like, ripping the fucking heads off of the things and going crazy with it. Like, just start banging on it. Like, beating the devil out of it. But he's just kind of wandering around on his own little journey through the cosmos in his mind. And then he starts crawling like Tommy Pickles. They should stop the music. Oh my god, he's gonna fall, dude! One of the writers suggests they stop the music, but I gotta tell ya, that will never happen at Disney. Come hell or high water, there could be a Category 5 hurricane blowing through that's picking up actual C4 plastic explosives, throwing them around the park, and that music would not stop. Disney would try and somehow weave that into the magic. Disney takes that shit so seriously. I, I don't think there's any occasion where the music in that ride would stop. Even if the whole motherfucker was on fire, you would be going straight to Valhalla with It's a Small World playing, <laughs> sending you off there. I don't think that was ever in the cards here, because Disney does legitimately take like this magic seriously. At least when it comes to like its performers and all of that. So, anyway, he's crawling through the It's a Small World ride. Eventually, he wanders outside we also get like a uh, like a cryptid video of him on his way outside i believe another writer finds the scene of the crime where the clothes were first shed and then ends up catching a bigfoot spotting of the streaker on his way out now in the timeline of events here there's more footage that i can't show you but he takes his boxers off and starts bare ass naked splashing around in the water in the park so all the guests can now see him, not just the ones in the It's a Small World ride, it's pretty much anyone around the area. Authorities eventually do show up. I was half expecting, like, the goddamn army to show up since it's Disney. Like, I thought this would be immediate five stars in GTA and they summon, like, the goddamn men in black to apprehend this guy. But it's just normal officers that show up, they handcuff him, and then they carry him out completely naked, walking by guests, and they have him, like, he's some kind of prized pig in like a like a contest so they've just got him like hoisted up and they're carrying him out in front of all the guests so there's a ton of footage of just the naked streaker being like paraded through the park which is really shocking because in disney world where i live in florida apparently they have secret tunnels so that way if there's like a crime or if someone needs to be escorted out they do it through these secret tunnels so the guests are none the wiser they, the guests don't ever get exposed to it Whereas in Disneyland, they don't have those secret tunnels, so instead they just have to carry the, the naked villain out in front of all of the kids and families in the park. So I thought that was really interesting. I also didn't know about the secret tunnels until this, but that's also fucking fascinating that Disney has their own underground network to, like, push people through so that way no one ever sees them again. Like the fucking Paris catacombs is how I imagine it. This is definitely not the fairy tale experience guests were expecting when they visited the park that day. I'm actually shocked that it went on as long as it did to go from inside the ride in the boxers to then outside the ride completely naked. I thought Disney would start like arresting you and getting you out of the park if you even thought about doing something that goes against their rules. But this guy was around for quite a little while it seems. There's more photos and videos of him than any of the Disney cast members and mascots that people take pictures with. So that's a pretty infamous photo now. Uh, more information has come out about him. So he's a 26 year old. It has been confirmed he was under the influence of a controlled substance, which I think everybody could figure that out just doing the old eyeball test. It does seem like he's on some shit. And he was booked for two misdemeanors. I also imagine he will be on the sex offenders registry for this for the rest of his life. For obvious reasons. He went to a Disney theme park which primarily has families that bring their kids, and he got naked and wandered around, splashed around. Clearly, he is going to end up on the sex offenders registry for that. They haven't disclosed which substance he was on, but I do think the working game theory that it was PCP is probably accurate. At least in... <coughs> Whoa. Well, <laughs> had quite a lot happen there. 
You're welcome for the beautiful mouth noises that, that were produced from that. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of phlegm in the back of my throat. But I do think PCP is probably correct. Not that I'm some kind of wizard that can identify exactly what he was on. I, I'm not exactly a connoisseur when it comes to PCP. But from all the videos that surface from time to time, it seems like the common thread is getting naked while on PCP. So, seems like that could probably be accurate here. Not that it really matters at the end of the day. It's a life-ruining moment for this individual. All because they decided to go to Disney and do some foul shit. So, yeah, just wanted to go over this a little bit because it is a pretty crazy story. That's about it. So, yep. The title is no exaggeration. I am likely the only man in the entire world who has a certain ultra-rare CD that you actually can't get anymore. It's an ancient artifact, a fucking treasure on the same scale as finding the City of Gold. It's like the Wu-Tang Clan album Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, the one that where, they, where they only made one and sold it for like 50 billion dollars and then pharma douchebag Martin Shkreli bought it. But this... This is rarer than that. It's a true one-of-a-kind. The Smithsonian would love to get their hands on it, I'm sure. And I'm going to share it with all of you for free. It's the holy grail of music that all collectors would eat themselves to get their hands on. Bang. This is a banger that I brewed when I was only 11 years old. It is a Disney Quest original song from Charlie, young Charlie. It's called Let's Party, Party, Party Tonight. Now, if you listen to my streams at twitch.tv slash moistcritical or watch the official podcast, you will have heard me talk about this relic. This is from a place called Disney Quest. Disney Quest got torn down a few years ago to make an NBA condom store or something. Just some fucking garbage sports shop. But Disney Quest was once a prime arcade filled with cutting-edge technology straight from sci-fi movies. Or at least that's how it appeared to an 11-year-old Charlie. This shit was mind-blowing and they had a make-your-own-music uh, area there. And in that area, I was able to craft this masterpiece, the Citizen's Cane of Music. This is up there with some of Beethoven's best. This is up there with Mozart. Uh, let me just go ahead and play the whole song for you, and then we can go ahead and reflect on the, uh, the old lyrics inside. Let's party, party, party tonight! Yeah, the song was even better than I remembered. It sounds like some shit out of Orange County Choppers, like their theme song, or the Power Rangers or something. But you can't stop wiggling your finger to that boner jam, huh? you will It's catchy, you'll definitely be singing this. I guarantee this song has a chance in the mainstream, especially with like fucking shitty Fortnite parodies and Minecraft songs being that big. Let's party, party, party tonight. It's about to take the entire world by storm, I imagine. So, we have the lyric sheet in here. Here's the CD looking absolutely groovetastic, just some real banging shit. 
You also have the date on here, which is January 6th of 2005, which is a little shameful because I, I thought I made this when I was like six years old, but I was, I was 11, so I probably should have known better. But it's almost been 14 years or 15 years on the dot, which is nuts. I'm so glad that I was able to find this. So let's go line by line. I know your boss is crazy. Now, I was 11 years old. I wasn't in the working environment yet. I had no friends that worked in sweatshops, so I didn't really have any experience with crazy bosses, but I thought it was a really great opener, a really strong one, and could also capture more than just a child audience because you know, I'm sure adults had crazy bosses, you know what I mean? School's been getting you down. I mean, who, do who doesn't get down at school sometimes? You know, shit gets a little boring. Let's go out for some sushi and bust that funky town. Full disclosure, I had never had sushi at this point. I didn't try sushi until I was 19 years old. I, I do love sushi, so it's it's a lyric, a line that's aged beautifully like a fine wine. Bust that funky town. People don't usually talk like that anymore, so that's kind of dated. But I think that's what helps give it some charm. There'll be gourmet food and a DJ too. I mean, you're just getting a five-star experience. This is a fantastic restaurant, probably one of Ramsey's, I'd imagine. That's probably what I was picturing with these. Uh-huh. You're gonna feel brand new. Who doesn't want to feel rejuvenated? And then we get to the hook. Let's party, party, party tonight. Fuck yeah. Let's mumbo, mumbo, mumbo till the day is light. Ooh, that's a lot of mambo in, baby. But luckily you got some sushi in your tummy and you're about to have some chocolate coming in soon with the chocolate delivery of 50 pounds or whatever the fuck kind of a, a crazy amount of chocolate I put in the lyrics. Now, how the lyrics were constructed, if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm sure that I am, because this was big for me, I thought I was going to be the next, you know, P. Diddy. Uh, you had a pre-selected, you had like 50 different options of choosing like lyrics and lines and you could like mix and match it kind of just like a game of ad lib. So these aren't totally original lines. I'm sure if I was writing it totally, you know, off the cuff, we'd have words tossed in here that I was learning on Xbox Live. So it, it would have been far more explicit, a little bit more vulgar. But anyway, let's get back on track. The jam is really kicking and we're feeling all right. I mean, that's an understatement. The jam is more than kicking. The jam is kicking, spitting, and shitting, baby. This is just a lit jam for sure. Let's party, party, party. Tonight, yeah, here we go. This is when it really gets nuts. Buy six pounds of chocolate, we're gonna lose control. That's an excessive amount of chocolate. That is more chocolate than an 11 year old boy needs, even if he's throwing an entire party jam. You know what I mean? That's just too much, especially on top of some sushi in Funky Town. Like, that's there's a lot going on. There's gonna be it's a big sugar rush coming in. Six pounds of chocolate, that's just that's way too much for this, this little hootin' nanny here. Just put on your favorite jam now. We're gonna break parole. Now this is, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in retrospect and hindsight. You know, put on your favorite jam. Obviously it's gonna be Let's Party 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 Tonight by Charlie. But we're gonna break parole? That just really doesn't make any sense. What kind of responsible parents gonna let their kids around, you know, convicts on, on parole? You know what I mean? Like, And, and why would those convicts even want to be at this party full of full of children sushi and chocolate it's just it just doesn't make any sense that'd be a really weird party and it'd just downright be unsafe so that line questionable at the very least you can do your work another time but right now let's bust our own rhyme poetry absolute genius that's golden that's just fucking great and then we wrap back around to the hook we take her home let's party 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 tonight Let's break it, break it, break it, till the day is light. What are we breaking? Fucking anything we can get our little snot-nosed hands on, I assure you. Shit's getting broken here. Tomorrow we can worry. Tomorrow we can fight. Probably, you know, what's, what's more fun after a party than just getting into a, a giant fucking brawl, a mosh pit? Let's party, party, party tonight. That is music. You can't find bangers like these in the modern music industry. This song may just sail up to the top of Billboard number one. I'm telling you, this could be the new Old Town Road. It really, it has potential. I don't, even if it did, I don't know who would be able to claim ownership, me or Disney Quest, Mickey Mouse, I don't fucking know. Walt Disney's corpse, he might be just revived, he just rise from the grave. I own Let's Party 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 tonight. I don't know how it would go. But God damn it, I'm so glad I found that. I've listened to it at least 10 times today. That shit gets me hype. It is a fantastic song, timeless 
even, I'd say. But anyway, just wanted to share that with you. That's it. See ya. Okay. Now I saw, I definitely want to do the funk plan, but uh, I saw this earlier. Apparently he made something on Disney Quest. This tickled my nutsack real hard because Disney Quest, I loved Disney Quest. I used to go to Disney Quest as often as my parents would let me. This was the fucking innovator of gaming. Like this shit was so cool. It was a five story arcade just filled with chaos. Uh, you know, prepubescent hormones throughout the air. Everyone just enjoying cutting edge technology. Like these goofy fucking games. It was so fun. So, I'll give you a brief lore update. Disney Quest was taken down in 2016. They demolished Disney Quest to put up a fucking NBA experience where you go and just play basketball like you shoot three pointers you pay twenty dollars to shoot balls and then it's a merch store so you just get like nba merch and then you can shoot three pointers a little bit it's fucking terrible it's dog shit i like basketball but i don't know why i would pay fucking twenty dollars to just shoot three pointers it's dumb but disney quest in its death throes like when it was on its way out was one of the saddest places you could ever go i went five months before it closed and i didn't know it was on its way out i went in late 2015 uh, and it was fucking sad. Half of the games didn't work. There were actual shit stains all over the floor. It hadn't been cleaned in so long. There was only four employees that I could count on all five floors. It was absolutely disgusting. It was so sad to see it in that state, man. But I wish instead of demolishing it, they just upgraded it. Like, it's still such a good idea. A five-story arcade is so cool. However... Disney Regional Entertainment was not even created until over a year after the GameWorks announcement. So did Disney copy the idea? It's certainly not the first time. Yeah, fuck yeah, they did. Under the it's Disney. CEO Michael Eisner. The They'll steal is, shit. Who gives a fuck? Why? Out of all of the entertainment concepts what they do, baby. up in the 90s in these parks. The birthplace the of let's party, party, party tonight. Yes. The locations hadn't even been announced. Fuck so yes. why expand into an emerging... I still have that. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, this is a, one of my prized treasures. This is where it all began. The humble beginnings of Charles's music career, Disney Quest. Let's party, party, party tonight. Oh, it's... Fuck, it's so good. Buy six pounds of chocolate. We're gonna lose control. Yes, sir. And lose control we did. That place is fucking buried now. Play it. Uh, I don't have a CD player. I mean, I made a video with it. I can just play the excerpt, I guess. Let's party, party. Oh, yeah. This song slaps. This song fucking slaps so hard. Woo! So at Disney Quest, you could make your own songs, and this is what I came up with. And a DJ, too! Uh huh. Is this actually you singing? I was eight years old. Yes, it was me singing. Such a good song. I mean, that's that song is timeless. That's up there with the greats, like the Bohemian Rhapsody for kids. God, what a good song. Thank Market you, Disney Quest. Take on a company. Sample it for a gentleman song? I actually wanted to. I still do. I wanted to turn it into a Doom style song and come up with like a crazy, violent, hyper hardcore, gory music video for it. Though it had been implemented into specialized use for fields such as medicine and engineering Things since the 1970s, in tactics and the virtual reality Solaris. technology wasn't seen as ready for consumers until the 1990s. <clears throat> One of the first commercial uses of the technology Whoa. would be the insertion of virtual reality pods into arcades, malls, and movie theaters. These had horrible graphics, constrained movement, high costs, and generalized filth. The system in one game so not much has changed. around fifty thousand dollars to purchase. Take that VR. Cost the no, VR is kind of wacky these days, actually. That's just disingenuous. And ten dollars. VR is fucking nuts. For inflation. By the late nineties, the future of the medium was bleak, but GameWorks and therefore Disney saw potential. And there was a lot of VR games, games at Disney Quest. Would be the main attractions. By that I mean the three. Complexes. There were three. On Ju Disney Quest opened its doors Here's on June nineteenth, nineteen ninety-eight. There was little build-up to its debut and the structure oh, was nearly finished a so year good. prior to its opening. 
When questioned in the months leading up to its opening, Levitt and other executives referred to that the game sucked as ass. The this game is dog shit. This was like the central focal point when you first enter Disney Quest. On the first floor, you'd come in. This is the first thing you'd see. It's like this dog shit ass fucking pinball hockey hybrid game that is just completely rigged. At random, it would choose one of these little pods here to win, and no matter what you did, that pod would just fucking win. It's terrible. Still, in the summer of 1998, a large crowd gathered to enter Disney Quest for the first time, not sure what to expect from the new experience. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. I'm here in the virtual reality studio where Disney Imagineers are creating a whole new world. Oh, yeah, they are. It's a beautiful world, too. Inside this headset actually allow you to step into the world of Aladdin on a magic carpet ride. It's called virtual. <laughs> the world only exists yeah! In reality. Look at how cool the world is. You see not just what's on the screen. It's so full of life. The building was a huge five-story, 100,000 square foot oh, yeah. box. On the front and back of the building, there was a large set of Mickey ears with Disney Quest in large print. The building had no. Windows. I might even be in this video at some point. I fucking lived here contents. for a while. Concept art for the complex. Game they, the they gave you like a season pass that was just free entry for like a whole fucking year also for a hundred dollars or some shit. It's crazy. To the downtown Disney complex. So, this was the setup to the illusion that the oh. elevators were actually flying you to Holy a new shit. land. It was a subtle and fun touch. Forgot about the gold elevators. At the end of the lobby were the turnstiles to get on the elevator. Disney Quest was designed with a central hub known as Ventureport. Upon entering the main area. Guests could see a structure. I hope he goes through the majority of the rides. Telescope. I remember, or like the big the rides. I remember most of bridges. them. The replay zone, located on floors three, four, and five, featured midway on the moon, a classic arcade where guests yeah, could play this games was the most like boring part. air hockey, skee ball, and yeah. Tron. Kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. Astro Blasters Banger. also resided in this area. Banger. This was much different than the Buzz Lightyear dark rides that can be found at Disney parks throughout the world. That is a full-blown banger alert right there. Bumper cars with dodgeball. Each vehicle contained two guests. One would drive the car, and the other would fire dodgeballs at the other vehicles. The next zone. Those were fucking cannonballs, is what you were firing. Force three, four, and five. Shit the was main game nutty. In this area was the guests would stand on platforms and lean in different directions, controlling a virtual pinball on a large screen. Another game in the score zone was one of Disney's oh, yeah. premier VR attractions. Mm -hmm. Ride the comics. Guests would don large visors and hold motion detecting sabers, swinging them violently as they fought. Oh yeah, the now we're feeling it. Were multiple bays. Ergot was in this game as well, by the way. The last attraction in the score zone was Invasion, an extraterrestrial. The uh, Riot Games ripped off Ride the Comics. Ergot was the main villain in Ride Com Ride the Comics. Hold on, let me see if I can still find the pictures. Damn, it doesn't have the boss battle. Yeah, one of the main bosses that you'd team up on and ride the comments was quite literally Ergot. Well, this is sad. They didn't even, like, put their artwork online for prosperity's sake. It's just dead now. I, I can't even find, like, the promotional pieces. Well, I guess this is as close as we get. Yeah, this was one of the bosses. Quite literally was Ergot. He had, like, a little walker that he'd walk around on. Other attractions in the Create Zone included Radio <gasps> Disney Song. Yeah! That's the place. That's where that's where this banger was brewed. Let's party 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 tonight. That came from the song maker booths there. They should have named one of them after me for the fire I created in this laboratory. It's almost fucking insulting that my name isn't on one of these booths. Cyberspace Mountain. Mm -hmm. Cyberspace Mountain was a simulator ride in which guests could design their own roller coaster. So it good. Began with a tutorial so good. by Bill Nye the Science Guy. Fucking Bill. Riders how to properly construct their coaster. Cyberspace Mountain allowed guests to ride their creations in a simulator car capable of tilting, turning, and even flipping them. Oh, it was down. so the good. version of this concept would later appear in Disney parks as the Son Sun of Ball Thrills, bitch. a 2009 edition cool. to Interventions in Epcot. The last zone was the Explore Zone. But it was kind of Weenie Hut Jr. because if you made the ride too extreme, they wouldn't let you ride it. So if you did like six corkscrews back to back, they wouldn't let you ride it because the G-forces would kill, like actually kill you. The third immersive attraction was this one was okay. This one was kind of cool. Yes, would board an inflatable raft. You'd row and shit. Top of a large pad and yell at your mom for not putting her the fucking back into in it. Jungle cruise at the Magic Kingdom before a virtual skipper sends guests to the age of the dinosaurs. The skipper accidentally drops the device that controls the time machine, and guests paddle down the river in an attempt to grab it. The pad below reacted to the player's paddles and the. They flow spray of the water you with toilet to water too. Moves. Yeah, you get hit with raw sewage to really get immersed. The zone was Treasure of the Ink. Disney Quest also had a few restaurants that guests could eat at. These counters and they were good. The food Quest, the Wonder. They only like sold French fries, and, the and that was about Factory it. Express, a smaller scale cheesecake factory concept exclusive to Disney Quest. The complex, 
No, oh my God! Rush in Ohio was given Buzz a just blows up. Apart from the criticism of the complex's cheesy architecture not fitting in with the surrounding area, true, very sure out of place. Disney would see a return on the investment. Interest in both GameWorks and Disney Quest was dwindling fast. The ever-changing landscape of technology was diverting consumer focus to the internet and home consoles. And while the Thanks public was eager to experience both indoor amusement center concepts, the chances of locals becoming regulars was falling. Where are the right gamers there. at? This meant that Disney Quest Chicago would Let's have see to some gamers. Tours, which did not bode well for a large-scale regional expansion. The head of attendance calculating at the Walt Disney Company estimated that around 3 million guests would visit Disney Quest per year. Pretty However, good. However, this would have been nearly impossible, as proved by this quote from a 1999 article from the Chicago Tribune. The average length of stay is in the two and a half to three hour range. So to cram in three million visitors a year while maintaining some crowd control, Disney Quest would have to stay open about 17 hours a day. Shit, who did the math? Day, Redditor? Full capacity, the no, they, were, they killed Disney Quest night, no one had with math. Anything from the opening of Club Disney. In late 2000, mm -hmm. both Disney Quest Orlando and Disney Quest Chicago received a brand guy. new attraction. Hercules in the Underworld was replaced by Pirates yes. of the Caribbean. Battle this was a much Game better World, version. Which featured large screens surrounding a miniature pirate ship that guests This one was play. cool. Each player would have a physical cannon that would fire digital cannonballs at enemy ships. Guests playing the game would have to defeat the Jolly Roger, which was not an easy task. And the majority of players would lose the game, with their boats sinking. Yeah, this game was hard as fuck. This was like the Dark the Souls of, of dead VR Disney games. Quest games were designed by Randy Posh. On top of this, reviews of the Chicago location had not been stellar. The lines were long. The price of admission, sixteen dollars for two and a half hours of games, was too expensive for. That's money, and pretty good, to be fair. The magic that the theme parks could. Uh, the Disney old Quest magical Orlando Disney Quest. I mean, well. shit. But Disney Quest Chicago, however, 2016 came and went with Disney Quest staying open the entire year. Really? Wait, what? Until January 30th, 2017, that Disney would announce that Disney Quest final day was to be July 2nd. To commemorate I thought closing, it closed in 2016. Apple discounts made ticket prices, which had increased slightly in its nearly two decades of operation, exactly $19.98, as a tribute to the year that it opened. After 19 years of operation, Disney Quest closed its doors. The building sat abandoned for one month until demolition began in August. Oh. Construction has begun on the NBA experience, Ugh. which is set to open in the summer of 2019. And it sucks. It's Closure trash. Orlando, Garbage. Along with the recent I don't care what anyone says. Disney Quest? Fucking paradise. That place was incredible. It, except if you went there as an adult in like 2015, because that shit was just sad. I have a friend named Jackson. Some of you know him from the official podcast, and Jackson is visiting from Australia for the next 10 days. And like most grisly, hard-working men, Jackson has a hobby. Some men's hobby includes watching football and titties, drinking beer from a boot up their ass. Jackson's hobby is a little bit more innocent. Jackson enjoys the simple pleasures of building Lego Star Wars sets. So naturally, one of the first places I wanted to take him was the place where dreams come true. Legoland. I'd only ever been to the park one time and I didn't really enjoy it when I was a toddler. I just kind of viewed it as Disney World's disappointing brother who was addicted to meth. But I was going in with an open mind and open ass this time around, really ready to take in just the Lego joy and give Jackson a, a day that he will always look back on fondly with a wet spot in his pants. So let me show you the journey through Legoland. <laughs> We fucking made it, boys! Now the first thing that we all took note of and were all surprised about was that the park was predominantly filled with children. Based on the way Jackson always talks about LEGO Star Wars in the building process, I was expecting the park to be filled with MIT graduates and full-blown architects. <laughs> Does it smell like real LEGO? It does not smell authentic. It smells like Le Pen. <laughs> oh god. They've had us yet again. Where did those come from, Jackson? Yeah, can you trace the origin of the Lego bricks? The child labor factories? <laughs> Smells like an 1886 yellow brick designed by George Lego himself. <laughs> I'd like to just call attention to Jackson's hat. This is a hat we found in the park. It says best day ever, and it's not kidding. In fact, I think it's underselling it. This is a day none of us will soon forget. It was quite the adventure. But then we have to carry it around everywhere. We yeah. can drive it around. We can drive it. It's <laughs> child sized. Yeah. You'll hut fit in. You build your own motor. It's like a landfill of Legos. Good. There's so much disease in there that you're touching. Just run your hands through it. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. These are the old for red. Ooh. ASMR Legos. The forgotten Ooh. pieces. My god. It's a bucket of trash. 
After rummaging through various Lego stores and after Jackson's shock and awe and jubilation wore down a bit and simmered, we realized that we had come in time for one of the world's best and most famous water shows, the Brickbeard's Assault. Uh, I can't quite remember the exact name, but it's basically, in essence, a tyrannical, menacing pirate named Brickbeard has just raped and pillaged the good towns across Brickwater, and now it's up to us, the audience, to go in there and stop him and put an end to this this evil reign of his. And it was quite the show, I'll show you some of that. And uh, it's honestly a shame that Brickbeard isn't a more well-known name. I know everyone's heard of Shamu from SeaWorld, but... I can't even believe that people aren't talking about Brickbeard constantly or begging for a Brickbeard feature-length film. You know, you have the Lego movie, Lego Batman, but where's Brickbeard? Far, far away that's Brickbeard, that's it. No, that's his dad. Brickbeard Senior. <laughs> good Lord, Brickbeard's going for it. They need volunteers, Jackson. You can fight Brickbeard. Let me fight Rick Bid! You can liberate brick water! You get a kiss from Captain Miranda. So just in case there's a few people out here who haven't seen this show for some reason, I'll go ahead and give you a bit of the narrative. So Brickwater has been subject to the unbelievably hostile reign of Brickbeard. And the things he's done to them is just reprehensible. We damn near lost an audience member to Brickbeard with a public beheading. And what you're seeing here is the Imperial Lego attack force, the Imperial soldiers that are willing to stand up to Brickbeard. These are our heroes, and these are the people that we get behind, along with the leadership from the one, the only, Captain Miranda. And her sidekick, Salty. It's the Brickbeard Shuffle. Jesus Christ! It's Brickbeard! How did you stand up? Yeah, how did Brickbeard even conquer the seas with that kind of attitude? Luckily, we were able to emerge triumphant here in the battle against Brickbeard, and it was entirely due to the incredible leadership of Captain Miranda and the tenacity of the seven of us who went. I think if we weren't in the audience there, this could have turned out very differently and far worse for the harbor and the people of Brickwater. So, luckily, we attended the 1215 show and pretty much saved the day. After we defeated the Scourge of the Sea, we walked around the park a little bit, some more photos, of course, because this is a very special day for Jackson. We toured some of the miniature areas filled with Legos to which Jackson couldn't believe the craftsmanship of the master builders on the premises. And uh, it was just truly an eye-opening experience. The things you can do with Legos are far beyond what I thought capable. I, I didn't even think science could extend this far, let alone Legos. <laughs> I know that craftsmanship anyway. <laughs> Who built that one, Jack? Jay the Brickman, I believe. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's attacks! Jay the Brickman's done it again! <laughs> We also got to see some of LEGO's most famous characters. There's this guy sitting on a bench here looking like the album cover to a lo-fi hip-hop groove. Or perhaps Lil Pump if he was translated into the Simpsons universe. We even got to see Ray from Star Wars. I tell ya, I've never seen Jackson so excited and nervous at the same time. Now I bet you're wondering, Charlie, Dag, Nabbit, why haven't you gone on any rides? Why haven't you shown us any of the thrills at Legoland? Well, fuck you, we can't go on those rides because we're too old. The rides were exclusive to 13 years and younger. You aren't allowed on most of the rides as an adult, which does make a lot of sense when you see the scale of some of the rides. For example, they had a Ford driving course, which I thought would be appropriate for Jackson since he doesn't drive and doesn't have a license. I thought maybe we could get in there with the training wheels on it, the Ford driving course for four-year-olds, and maybe get him behind the wheel and get comfortable enough to start taking it to the next level. But you can't. It's for children. There was only two rides that we were allowed to do. But the wait was around 80 minutes, so it probably wasn't worth it to do that. But I'm not bothered by it because I think the real fun and the real thrill is the memories you build with those around you when you attend the Lego Land. And that being said, we definitely saw some things on this journey we didn't expect to see. And what do you got there, Jackson? I believe this isn't legitimate Lego, but I might need to go in for a taste test first. <laughs> Naturally, <laughs> like any good specialist. And it wasn't just Jackson having all the fun, even Andrew got to meet one of his heroes at Legoland. 
All right, Charlie, how's your Legoland experience? Beyond words. I'm still rattled from Brickbeard. You're doing so good, Jackson. I've been practicing. Oh, the, look at these fine master builder hands. That's the best J I've ever seen. Look at that technique. You won't call it cooperation? Oh no, everyone, <laughs> it's too rectangular. I need another six piece, anyone? I need the perfect length. Oh. All in all, I'd say the adventures we shared at Legoland will last a lifetime, and I think it's very clear now why Legoland has earned its title as the happiest place on earth. That's it. See ya. From about the ages of 2 to 10, I lived in Orlando, and I was a really outdoorsy kind of kid, which I know is probably surprising for most of you to hear, considering I'm like a fucking basement goblin now who rarely goes outside for more than the gym and the movie theater. But growing up, I used to always like to be outside in Orlando, and I used to love theme parks like Universal and Disney. But among these titans was a little guy named Fun Spot, who I felt never really got the credit it deserved. Fun Spot is an amusement park that's one-eighth the size of the big boys. All the fun and joy of an amusement park, but in the fucking surface area of a takeout box. Fun Spot is basically the bing of theme parks. Yeah, it exists, but no one really thinks about it. Fun Spot is absolutely great though, and it's some of the most patriotic shit I've ever seen. Jackson's still visiting from Australia, so I thought definitely gonna take him to Fun Spot. This shit is as American as it gets. The only thing more American than Fun Spot is a fucking Bass Pro Shop. So we come to Fun Spot and it's like you're entering Heaven's Pearly Gates. Just look at this beautiful entrance, letting you know you're in for a rip-roaring great time. What do you think of Fun Spot, Jackson? It's beautiful. <laughs> Real life guitar skills. This is putting a little cream in your jeans, I bet. Hadn't seen Guitar Hero since I was in fucking high school, but was still able to crank out some incredible combos on expert mode. I can't let the audio of the song play much longer because I don't want to get a copyright strike here, but I'd like to point out that this Guitar Hero controller is extremely fucked up. It's like Thor's hammer. It's extremely heavy. I don't know what it's made out of, adamantium or some shit, but it's super heavy. The buttons are extremely sticky. I felt like I was playing the game in slow motion there. The buttons were covered in fucking and maple syrup and also when you're strumming the strumming feels like you're trying to start a fire between two bricks it is extremely hard but i was still able to do decently on expert andrew damn near full comboed the bitch but he plays guitar in real life so obviously that's going to translate here also a lot of the audio that i filmed is unusable yet again because walking around fun spot sounds like you're walking through a park in roller coaster tycoon just constant screaming and hollering which is great because that's what fun spot's all about the thrills and the joy <laughs> <laughs> what happened out there, champ? I was <laughs> shredding too hard. <laughs> shredding Good too job, hard. Tiana. Oh, Good job, Tiana. Get the screen. It's getting worse, man. I'm in the screen. Oh, oh, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> 93% to 68. God, this some it's like literally playing a block of cement. Yeah, the strummer is way more stiff, probably so people can't break it. It's oh, not fun. Jesus. It is not fun. I just slapped that shit really hard like I was trying to teach it a lesson. <laughs> Have you enjoyed your I love it! <laughs> America fun spot fun spot in America is the best fun spot in America. <laughs> That's not even sponsored. I like that. What a guy. <laughs> After Jackson picked out his favorite United States of America hat, we decided to walk around for a bit and decided not to go on any of the go-karting tracks or roller coasters and instead settled on the most important attraction at Fun Spot, perhaps the most important attraction across all of theme parks, the American Fun House. The America experience condensed into a short three-minute walk-through wacky adventure. No, I have no doping. This is it's bad. the integration line, Jackson. Baptism by freedom. Oh, Jesus. 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 Bro, what the fuck I'm is so this? glad I'm not claustrophobic. Holy fuck. Oh, my lord. Is that kidding? Oh, it? my god. Watch out, Jackson. There's a fighter jet behind you. Oh, fuck. What is this? Oh. God, this is oh. nuts. It's the quicksand of Columbia. <laughs> oh, careful, Jackson. 
It's like a wipeout it's course. It's the Tetris wall of America. Watch out for the apocalypse. Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> it's crowd control. Oh, the take out. <laughs> Up here in saloon, Jackson. Smell my American law. Uh, it's freedom farts. Give me the ass. I see it. Oh. In all its glory. <laughs> it's a trap doll. And it's It's like Dark Souls. <laughs> you just have to take a leap of faith. Like those who first colonized it. Oh. Like the pilgrims. Jackson, look out, it's free healthcare way. Oh. <laughs> Be careful, Jackson. Jackson, do you have insurance? What is this? Yeah. <laughs> Danny's been caught in the trap in the washing. It's like a scene out of Austin Powers. We brought How is this more nauseating than all the rides? This is the price of freedom. <laughs> Our forefathers did it, and now Jackson is too. Uh, I avoided the trap downstairs, but I'll take the more adventurous route this time. Yes, this has killed many a men. Careful, Jackson. <laughs> He's done the impossible. What is my citizenship? Of freedom, Jackson. It's the slide of broken backs. That's what <laughs> that is. <laughs> All right, we're going to let your time. Don't kill <laughs> I'm not doing oh, that. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> well, someone's got to do this. Alright, let's yeah, go. Yeah, oh, yeah. there it is. Tell us if freedom rings. Yeah, baby. <laughs> She's going to plow into a child at the bottom. Just the, her body, but without the head. Yeah. X, I'm taking the stairs. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Fuck that. The great power chains. Ah, you've emerged an American. Oh. You. You entered a boy and you came out a man. Jackson, I'm a citizen. A you free man. A citizenship program. What a hero. It's like the fun spot slogan says, if you're not having fun, go fuck yourself. Obviously, being born and raised in this country, I've been through this uh, American wacky wild funhouse plenty of times, but this one was special. This one felt like the Oregon Trail. There was something very unique about this American box of fun. And I have to say, it's, you know, it's just like Fun Spot says, you'll have fun or fuck you. That's, that's the way, boys. Onwards! Hi ho, stallion! <laughs> Buckling up. It doesn't fit. <laughs> Get ready for some intense G-forces. It's like Red Dead Redemption 2 in here. <laughs> Have you ever ridden a carousel? I think so, a few times here and there. An American one? Nothing like this though. Nothing as free and liberating as this. Oh, uh, of course. <laughs> oh, this is adorable. I want off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you gotta be careful. Yeah, be careful. You're not sure. You're not safe. Yada, how could you? You're not safe with that explain. You have a right procedure. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, there is nothing more American than riding a dirty, filthy carousel with some four-year-old shit streaks run across the back of the horse. That is what I needed to show Jackson, and I was happy Fun Spot was able to accommodate with perhaps one of the most patriotic carousels, Merrick Rounds, I have ever seen in all of my days. <laughs> Jackson, do you want a photo with Freedom Flyer? Everyone's favorite Avenger? Freedom Flyer. First taste of American freedom. Pose like a... Yeah, give us a Freedom Flyer pose. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there it is. I know. I couldn't believe it either. The Freedom Flyer. Everyone's favorite superhero. They also had a Statue of Liberty as well. Like a small scale Statue of Liberty monument. But I didn't see it until we were leaving, so we didn't get a chance to get a picture with it or anything like that. But that's kind of like the whole thing with Fun Park. It's basically like a Japanese tiny meal kit. You know, those like small meals that you can make from Japan that are like the size of something that only a mosquito could eat. Basically the size of Mr. Krabs' world's smallest violin. It's like that, but for theme parks at Fun Spot. And it's great. 
We didn't go on the Freedom Flyer ride, unfortunately, but I imagine if we did, we would have come off the roller coaster with fucking war paint on our face, grown three inches, and had a crew cut by the end of it. That shit was just super fucking American. And uh, it was just a really all-around great experience. I think Jackson really got a full-ass pounding of American culture with an arcade. There's some go-karts, roller coasters, of course, the fun house, the walk through, the tour of America. It was incredible. Just absolutely incredible, top to bottom. And uh, it's a shame that Fun Spot isn't talked about up there with Disney World, Universal, and Chuck E. Cheese. Because it's, it's nuts. It's fucking great. That's it. So, yeah.